So good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Confidential Computing Microconference. This is this is the first one um, at Linux Plumbers, and I'm really happy about all the um, submissions that uh, I got. And I think we are going to have some great discussions. By the way, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, just fine. Great, thanks. So, first, next I want to thank um, our, our sponsors of this conference. Without the sponsors, the conference would not have been possible. First of all, the Diamond sponsor, Facebook. But also the Platinum sponsor, IBM. And our Gold sponsors, ARM and Microsoft. And the silver sponsors, AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat. And of course, uh, the speaker gift sponsor, Collabora. So with that being said, I think we get started with the, uh, oh, for, sorry, I forgot the t-shirt sponsor, VMware. Another one and the Linux Foundation for providing uh, the conference services, which is pretty important for an online conference. So, so with that, I think we, get, we can get started and dive into our first discussion about TDX live migration. Ray, would you uh, enable your camera and you should be a presenter now. You will use the slides I uploaded. So I want to be able to share my own here, right? Can you hear me? Hello? Say that again, please. Uh, you, you can hear my voice, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so my name is Wiyuan, and I'm from Intel. So I'm working on various virtualization related project. So for this one, I'm going to introduce, uh, give a uh, uh, high level introduction for this TDX now migration. Um, and uh, I just uh, had an introduction of this topic in KVM forum a couple of days ago. So some of you may already seen this one. But for the, uh, for the presentation here, I will just give the high level overview first and then uh, go into some detailed discussions. So I will reuse this slide here. So first, uh, we can review the TDX working model. So uh, with the uh, with the TDX supported uh, on Intel Server API and Neton CPUs, so we have a new execution mode added to the CPU called uh, the SIM mode. So which is split into SIM root mode and SIM non root mode. So this one is pretty much like the VMX root mode and the non root mode. So with the uh, the difference here is that. Uh, with the same root mode and non root mode, we are able to run the TD guest. So the TD guest runs in the same non root mode. So it is different from the VMX non root mode, which is the Lexi VM case. So because uh, now the hypervisor, so the QEMU and the KVM uh, gets uh, removed from the TCP. So they are not able to access the TD memory. So, so I list uh, those states here, like uh, the, the TD shared memory, it uh, remains accessible. So for the TD private memory, so it's not accessible. And also for the TD vCPU state, they are not accessible. So because of this isolation, that uh, KVM doesn't have direct access to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, to the TD states, uh, but it uh, assists the TDX module to manage the, those TD states. For example, for the secure EPT management, so the KVM still owns the memory allocation, so it gets the memory from the host memory management and then give the page to the TDX module to build this as secure EPT. So KVM talks to this TDX module through those same calls. So there are a couple of same calls exposed for the KVM to use. 
So, uh, so probably for this slide, I will skip this one. So I will directly give a high level overview of this uh, TDX non-migration framework. So here, uh, as you can see here on the source side, we have a source queue. So see, this is the source that you guessed. It needs to be migrated. And on the destination side, we also have the dest queue, which is the dest TD guest, which is launched when we want to do migration. And uh, on both the source and destination side, we need to boot a special TD called uh, micro TD. So this TD is a service TD. So it assists the uh, non migration process of the guest TD. So its responsibility is to do a compatibility check and a security attestation to ensure that the decision side environment is secure to migrate and also ensure the environment is migratable. Uh, so, uh, so it also has another responsibility is to generate a migration key. So the migration key is used throughout the migration process. So the key is set to the TDX module. So the TDX module receives this key. So when KVM asks for the private, private page to migrate, so the TDX module will do the encryption and then give the encrypted memory page to KVM and then KVM delivers this page to QEMU. Then QEMU send it to the destination side, destination side. So we can have a check on more details of MicroTD and I will have some, some deep dive discussion about MicroTD today. So for MicroTD, it's a service TD as I mentioned and it performs the basic job of migration policy evaluation and the migration key setup. And it talks to the TDX module using the TD core. And also it doesn't need to have any communication with the guest TD. So guest TD is a lot aware of this micro TD. And uh, when migration starts, the VMM will bind it to the bind it to the to the guest TD that uh, needs to be migrated. So for one micro TD, uh, we can have it support multiple guest TDs at the same time. Like if we have uh, like a six or ten guest TDs want to be migrated at the same time. In this case, we can just boot one micro TD to support all of those guest TDs to migrate. So finally, it's uh, the micro TD is a part of TCB, so it's included uh, in the guest TDs attestation. So it ensures the micro TD is runs uh, something that's expected to run. So there is a special case for the micro TD communication. So as you can see here, the source MicroTD and destination MicroTD is to set up a secure channel. So here is the TRS connection. So this secure channel is to securely transfer the migration key. So the key, so those channel needs to go to the go to the VMM and then go to the host network stack and then to the leak all the way to the destination side. So the socket here is a Relay entity which relays message send from the micro TD. So it's a special guest micro TD. So and then relay the message to the host kernel network stack. So this channel here is actually unsecure. So so when we so we did to set up the TRS communication to send this key. So there is a, a communication between the between the micro TD and the host. So it's a guest to host communication. So for this communication, we 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 design a VSOC transport here. So we have two choices here. One is to use the existing virtual VSOC, and another one is to use TD to use a TDVP VM core. So this is a special VM core from the guest to host. So we wanted to design a new communication channel using the VSOC protocol. And lastly, uh, so I, I will we can I will open more discussion about the micro TD communication, and after I finish the basic introduction. So for the micro TD, it's vendor specific. So for Intel here, we will provide a, a reference design and a raster based implementation. 
but the cloud vendors can design their own MicroTD to support the migration. So they can even, so for our basic design, we don't uh, implement any operating system inside the MicroTD, so it's a bare metal implementation. So if, uh, if the cloud vendors want, they can implant their own, even put a Linux-based MicroTD. But uh, in general, Linux-based MicroTD may, may be too large and uh, too heavy. So I'm not going to deep dive into these details because I want to leave more time for the discussion later. So here, for as, um, as you see that uh, we did to transfer the migration data from source to destination. So there are lots of data is to be transferred from TDX module to QEMU migration thread, which then send the data, encrypted data to the network and all the way down to the destination side. So, um, here I I build some kind of shared memory, so which is shared between the migration thread and the the, the QEMU side. So in the QEMU side, I actually implemented a KVM device based uh, emulation. So this uh, this is the kind of the logical and the interface to the from KVM to TDX module, and this emulated KVM device it creates the shared memory. So the shared memory includes the MBMD buffer and the payload buffer and the MAC list and the GP list. So when the when QEMU migration thread receives, it checks the bitmap and find a dirty page and finds that there it's it is a, for example it's a private page. So it sends a request through this device FD to KVM side the migration device, and then the migration device will use same course like export page. So it's a SIM core exposed from TDX module. So to export the data, then TDX module will use the encryption key, which was set by the micro TD in the pre-migration stage, and then encrypt the data data and put the encrypted data in the migration buffer, which is given by the KVM device. And also it creates some kind of header. So it's called a MBMD, which is the migration bundle metadata here. And also for each page, like uh, it supports the uh, multiple pages to be exported with one SIM core, export SIM core. So for example, we can have 16 pages in the list and each page is encrypted and each page is uh, has a MAC calculated by TDX module and filled in the MAC list buffer here and also a GP list so each GP correspond to a page in the in the in the green buffer here. So so basically we use shared memory to export those data. This is the framework. So I'm not going to present the implementation details. So here for uh, so the discussion I want to open here is uh, the first one is for the micro TD communication. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, we currently have two choices here. Actually, we are not finalized which one to use and we want to collect uh, more feedbacks either from the community and from the, uh, from the, from the customers. Uh, some of us here prefer to use to uh, use uh, Vertio VSOC and uh, some some of us prefer to use VM Core. So, for the reason for uh, for Vertio VSOC is uh, is that uh, the, it has some advantages to use. And the first one is it's uh, it's mature for Vertio VSOC. It's mature. It's already been in upstream for many years, and the design is mature. And there are some existing utilities like. Uh, in this picture, I, I, I mentioned the socket here. So th this this socket it supports it already supports the AF VSOC and it it has been verified that it works with the uh, Vertel uh, VSOC. But the disadvantage is that Vertel uh, VSOC is uh, KVM specific, and uh, so like uh, on Hapo V and uh, on VM. On VMware, they have their own VSOC devices, like Hub-V have their Hub-V star VSOC. 
and the VMware has the VMCI VSOC. So uh, the design is uh, different from Vertio. So if we support Vertio VSOC, so for the VMware guest, we may need to support the VMCI VSOC driver in their that uh, VMware micro TD. So we can we get to change something and uh, conditionally compile the VSOC device driver inside the micro TD. So there are people who want to support uh, VM core based uh, VSOC transport. Uh, the advantage is the advantage is that it's VMM agnostic. But uh, the in fact that uh, even it's the design from design point of view it's VMM agnostic. But uh, from uh, from the implementation point of view, uh, either Hyper-V or VMware or KVM, uh, all of those. Uh, Hypervisors need to implement the backend, the device side backend, on their own. So even the the design is shared. Um, but for the micro TD side, they can only have the the same driver following the design. So that that's the advantage of the VM core based VSOC transport. Um, but uh, the the big disadvantage here, and also my concern, is that uh, it uh, could be finally be a reinvention of what I we thought. Like uh, we may need to build the same shared rings for packet transmission. So for this one, it's so it's the disadvantage. Um, so this is the first topic I want to bring for discussion and see if there are any feedbacks from 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 you guys here or or if you follow the follow the, the thing I'm, I introduced. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the main disadvantage of using VSOC is that. Um, it, it might be difficult to do by a non KVM hypervisor. Um, I learned that I think VSOC is a, is a great choice. Um. Uh, yeah, actually, our our so our, our option here is uh, the VM core based VSOC or the existing Vertio based VSOC. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, the problem is um, if, if, if you have other hypervisors, let's say somebody wants to do Xen or, or something else, yeah. They, they might need to implement um, Virtio first, or you might end up with um, with something different um, for every hypervisor. So that, that's a disadvantage, I would say, of Virtio, that is somewhat KVM specific. Even though that's not true, I mean, there's some other hypervisors which have Virtio, but also there are lots of hypervisors which don't have Virtio, yeah. Um, hey, Andy, so one yeah. part of Virtio is uh, coming through in your implementation here? As 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 uh, somebody said, right? VSOC is implemented on Hyper-V as well. So mm -hmm. if you're only using the AFV, you know, the, the address family for VSOC, is that not enough here? Or yeah, but, yeah, but there, there might be still differences, even like say on Hyper-V KY, right? It's not. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm asking, you know, what part of what IO is coming through in your uh, interface boundaries here? That uh, no, we can't simply use our implementation of VSOC here. Well, I no, no. Okay. Yeah. So if we choose to use the uh, VM core based VSOC, uh, yes. we also need to uh, add the the backend implementation in different uh, hypervisors. Like uh, either Hyper-V or VMware, they need to implement uh, their own, add the, the own implementations to their hypervisor. So like uh, if I'm a Hyper-V developer, uh, I may think that I already have a Hyper-V style VSOC. So uh, what's the value to add a new VSOC here? So that might be a question as well. Right. So, so you know, assuming that uh, if, if Hyper-V were to use this uh, tech that you have here, we have to assume that I have all the backends for the various uh, front-end services we have. So if I want to use VSOC, I can expect to have um, the, the VSP for VSOC on the host side. But anyway, I, you know, I don't want to derail this discussion, but um, yeah, I'm curious to understand what other aspects of, of Vertio implementation of VSOC 
is percolating through these interfaces that makes it tied to Vertio. Seems uh, not ten minutes left, so probably I can. Any more comments on the on this topic? So, so, yeah, I, I have one. Why, why does the bottom you say uh, Intel provides a reference design, but the cloud vendor is supposed to do it all? So somehow. Uh, the voice wasn't clear to me. I did not hear that clear. At the bottom of this, you say Intel provides a reference design. You say the mid TD is vendor specific, and that vendor seems to mean cloud vendor, right? Are you expecting every cloud vendor to write their own? Because in open source, we'd rather receive it from somebody else. Yes, cloud vendors they can implement their own, but they did it to public uh, their own implementation and uh, make that uh, reproducible and uh, can be checked, can be verified. Why do they each have to do their own if they're all going to be public? Wouldn't it be better to have one open source implementation then? Uh, they can implement their, their micro TD and uh, publish their code on, the, on, the, on some public website, for example, and the people can just uh, rebuild that micro TD and uh, generate the hash so we will have a hash included in the test on the guest. I understand the attestation piece. So yeah. they need to write their own migration TD and then publish it so everybody can see it. But why then do we have to have in different, lots of different implementations per cloud? Why not just one open source implementation since it all has to be open source anybody, anyway, that everybody can trust and that everybody's verified? Um, just to make it flexible in case uh, like uh, cloud vendors, they wanted to add uh, their own policy evaluation. For example, they wanted to evaluate in their, in their environment uh, whether that's migratable or not migratable. So they may need uh, their uh, wait, wait. Policy does not belong to the cloud service provider on this. Surely it belongs to the Only they should be able to uh, allow or not allow the migration because otherwise they can be tricked into migrating to a node that is unencrypted or something. Uh, I'm not sure if I get that, but uh, um, you you know the the one of the responsibility of MicroTD is to do this policy evaluation, right? For example, the if the vendor have some physical machines like uh, uh, on, in different countries, and uh, those countries might have uh, some restriction to do the migration, so they may define their own policy. Right. Wait a minute, that's not a vendor, cloud vendor policy, that's a guest policy. Guests may decide they don't want their data migrating to different geographies. Cloud vendors are totally agnostic to what happens in their data center. Um, if we wish to present, prevent migration between two data centers, we could do it from the outside. We don't really care about it. Uh, 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 I think the discussion essentially was who owns the TCB. Is it, is it um, the cloud vendor? Because if the, if the service CD is provided by the cloud vendor, then the cloud vendor is in the, t in the TCB, right? But is it is that well, the, so the intention? Separate. Because yeah, who owns the TCB is different from who sets the policy. Yeah. Policy should definitely be a guest thing. It should not be a cloud vendor thing. If it's a cloud vendor thing, uh, we can trick the policy and use it to extract the data. But that's okay, mm -hmm. Jim, because all that I think they're saying is that you can provide a TD. Uh, migration TD that offloads the um, validation to the guest owner, and that makes you happy for you. So, Andy, I think it would be useful to really write down exactly what is the the threat model that you're trying to address here, and who's to be trusted. Because, you know, we don't want the guest to trust anything that the host is providing. When I say host, I mean the infrastructure provider, unless they choose to, right? They should, there should be a model where the guest doesn't trust anything outside of the guest. I think um, that's what James was saying as well. Um, I, I think that one model that we eventually probably need is, is um, um, so that that when, for example, that in in a case where you so who owns the trust is, um, 
So, so you have like a likely an operating system provider, like an OSB, for example, like a Linux distributor, and and that you you the guest has to trust the Linux system distributor right, to to have to to for the for the guest and so on. But um, they, probably they also have to supply anything that's also trusted by the guests, yeah. So um, <clears throat> so so for for a given cloud, so they for example they would need to provide the service CD. And they they probably also need to provide uh, the guest firmware and then things like this, yeah. So and anything that's that's like in the TCB of the guest would probably mm -hmm. need to come from from some trust entity, which is probably the that provider, yeah. So so at some point you basically I think you need a model where where the service CD comes together with the Linux distribution, so that that you can let's say you trust trust Red Hat or you trust Ubuntu or trust somebody yeah. like this, then you it, it all comes from the same same uh, party. <laughs> so uh, I think perhaps another way of, uh, of phrasing this question is uh, how does the guest specify what kind of migration TD measurement uh, it trusts or, or how, how does that happen? How, how, how do we pin the migration TD uh, that we trust? So the migration TV actually has some like a UUID and some some attributes. So all of those things are calculated uh, into a hash, and that hash is included in the in the report that uh, is asked by the by the guest TD to do to generate the code. So the code is for the attestation. So there are some info about the micro TD to ensure that's uh, that's the right micro TD that's going to be run to to be run. Okay, so basically the guest TD has full control over what kind of mic TD at the stations it, it wants to accept. Is that, am I understanding it correctly? Um, not the control action. It, uh, it actually, it, it checks, and so it checks which, which mic TD is going to be bound. Like even when the guest gets booted, the mic TD is not booted, but we have a pre-bound interface, which do some pre-bound of the, Micro TD that's going to be bound. So, so later when the micro TD gets booted, so when migration starts, the VMM starts the micro TD, and the, the micro TD has to be the one that's already be pre pre bound to the to the to the to the, to the guest when the guest gets boot, booted. So there is a, some kind of identity of this micro TD. It has to match to the to the TD that's. Of the hash which has already been included in the guest TD, when the guest TD boots, it do the attestation, including of the hash, and the hash corresponds to some kind of identity to this micro TD. So that that can be changed. I see. So basically, the basically the guest TD has uh, control over what mic td measurement it uh, it trusts yes yes some some kind of measurement mm -hmm. thank you okay i actually have a, another topic i want to discuss but i'm not sure if i have time left actually that, that one is not a specific to tdx it's also common to the to the svb line migration so i want to discuss about the that the structure used to record the private and the guest page. I saw the SEV patches from uh, from from Ashi, uh, if I pronounce his name correct. So that he's using that uh, the region list, which uses some shared some shared region list. So it's a address range to record if that page is private or not. And also another option is to use bitmap. So there are some advantages of using bitmap and using that uh, using that uh, shared region. So for the advantage of using bitmap is that it's simple and uh, it's more performant, and and the memory consumption is determined because it's proportional to the guest RAM size. For example, for one gig guest RAM, it is like a thirty-two KB bitmap, but the Disadvantage is that the guest with the huge page, huge memory size, may require a large bitmap size. Like if we have a huge guest, like one TB, it requires 32 megabytes memory of for bitmap. 
uh, and there is a solution that I found from upstream the discussion is that we can do guest memory donation. I think that's that's a good solution to do that. So the advantage yeah, of the yeah, I think we we discussed about that uh, quite a bit uh, on online discussions, and I think uh, the basic the thought process was that it's uh, it's uh, the bitmap probably is going to take a lot of memory and going to be uh, very sparsely populated compared to uh, probably just an interval list or a, just a kind of a linked list uh, of regions uh, because it's the guess is mostly going to be private memory, right, rather than shared memory. So. Uh, or unencrypted memory. So uh, probably the linked list uh, was a, looked like a much better solution uh, compared to a, a large bitmap, which depend which is dependent on the guest RAM size, and also probably is going to be you know as I mentioned going to be very uh, very minimally po uh, populated. Uh, but we we I have some notes on it uh, during my discussion, so we can probably continue that discussion at that time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. I think it's it's time to wrap it up and move to um, Ashish's discussion about uh, live migration um, on SMP and SCV. So um, let's see. Ashish. So Ashish, it's your turn. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So hi, uh, this is uh, my my name is Ashish Kalra. Uh, I'm I'm a software system design engineer at AMD. Uh, this is a discussion on live migration of confidential guests, but it's probably going to be uh, uh, a lot more uh, uh, really uh, discussion on uh, SEV specific things because that's the platform I work with. Uh, so as we have generally uh, been talking about it at, the, at this conference at a KVM forum that uh, the, the confidential guests or the guests are encrypted, so just you just can't simply copy the ciphertext between machines to migrate a VM. Uh, it's it's going to be encrypted uh, with that VM's key, so uh, transporting that to to another VM uh, with a different uh, encryption key is not going to work. Uh, what basically uh, AMD self key man key management API provides is a lot of functions, uh, a, a, a kind of firmware calls which uh, support uh, this kind of uh, uh, migration. Where we have commands like uh, you know where we basically start and. Uh, basically establish an encryption context using PSP. PSP is our security processor, so it's the AMD SP or the PSP uh, is a security processor. So we basically uh, have commands like send, uh, send start and receive start, which basically establish an encryption context between the source and target side. Uh, it uh, also sets up a migration key, uh, which is kind of encrypted and returned back uh, to, to the to the hypervisor, uh, it's encrypted, and then the hypervisor uh, uh, basically sends it across to the other side, uh, to the target side. And then there are specific commands like uh, specifically like send update data and uh, receive update data, which is basically used to send the ciphertext data uh, between the two VMs, the source and the target side. So it's uh, it's typically it's where. Uh, the, the first part of the send update command uh, data command basically decrypts the, uh, the, the, the guest VM data using the guest specific uh, VM encryption key and then encrypts it with the migration key. On the other side, is, and then the, the ciphertext data is basically transmitted. Sheesh. And then, all, yeah, yeah. So the, the payload in transit, is that encrypted with the customer key or is that uh, infrastructure key that's used to? Uh, you know, it's, it's a migration key. It's a, it's a transport encryption key or the migration key on which yeah. uh, the. And who owns who owns the key? Is that a customer key or no? Uh, who owns the? And where do you get that key from? Is that something the customer can have a say on, or is that something owned by the provider of the infrastructure? It's it's owned by the provider. It's basically generated through the AMD security processor. Okay. And it's going to be common key across all uh, migrations happening in the. Uh, no, it's, no, it's, it's an ephemeral key. Okay. Thank you.
And uh, so on the other side, so it's basically the other the receive update data command, which is then re-encrypts the basically basically decrypts the data with the encryption key, migration encryption key, and then re-encrypts with the VM encryption key of the other of the target site. So this is the generic way it works. Uh, how migration works on the uh, AMD SAB platform. Uh, we have kind of two proposals for it. One is basically the AMD secure based uh, processor based migration, which is the, the migration I talked about, which is the PSP based migration. And as I mentioned, uses the uh, pages are imported uh, and exported like with, a, with the migration key. This is a slow migration path because it's basically uh, uses the AMD PSP, which is a, a kind of a bandwidth. There is uh, like, it's that, that, that's, that's a bottleneck in this particular case. Uh, the other is a fast migration or which is in guest migration or guest assisted migration where there is basically a migration helper. As of now, uh, there's some kind of a prototype implementation from IBM research, which was also talked about in the KVM uh, forum and uh, which is implements the migration helper as part of the VM firmware that is the OVMF uh, portion. And uh, here, uh, it basically is the migration handler runs in a separate mirror VM, uh, which is a which is a clone of the primary VM, and shares the memory context and the encryption context with uh, with the primary VM. So if you look at the earlier uh, uh, basic uh, model, which I talked about, is the slow migration. Uh, the fast migration path does not use any of these PSP commands. Uh, it doesn't have the it doesn't use the send update data, receive update data, send start, receive start to start the encryption context it basically has uh, components which are uh, basically uh, two migration handlers a source and the destination migration handler which basically is launched on both uh, on the source and target side separately and also uh, attested separately and uh, they basically have a some kind of a synchronization uh, uh, kind of uh, a symmetric key implementation which i and and uh, uh, a more complex uh, key implementation where the key is generated by the guest owner and basically uh, inserted into the VMs uh, uh, after the test session is done, after the launch me measurement is done of, of the particular VM. So that it works in a slightly different manner than us. Also, it doesn't uh, use the PSP, so it's not restricted by the bandwidth issues which we have with the slow migration path. And probably also because the guest, it's in guest uh, migration, so doesn't need to uh, uh, do uh, decryption and encryption of the VM specific parts, just the transportation part. So also it uh, kind of uh, makes it faster in that sense. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the uh, fast migration parts already discussed as part of the KVM forum, uh, but there are some specific components here which kind of depend on that too. So, so we are going to kind of talk about that part specifically. Uh, these are the state of patches for the slow migration path. Uh, the hypervisor host Linux patches got merged in version 5.14. Uh, the guest kernel and the guest API patches are still in the discussion. I posted last uh, version 6. Uh, similarly, there is OVMF patches version 7, uh, which are also posted upstream. And then QMB patches were recently posted. They are more like an RFC patch right now. Uh, and there's been some discussion on it. Uh, 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 there's been discussions on all three components. Uh, we are, there's a specific parts, which I just want to continue here. So that we can probably have some consensus of what what we want to go ahead and do, and the guest assisted migration is more like an RFC right now. So it has uh, portions where uh, there is a mirror VM uh, part of QMU which was posted uh, upstream, and then there are the OVMF and the QMU specific parts of uh, the past migration, uh, which is again uh, under discussion right now. So uh, just looking at uh, uh, some basic. Uh, uh, things uh, which have been discussed and which already exist. So what we basically have uh, is a guest, uh, the guest kernel and the OVMF ma uh, making uh, a specific hypercall, which, which is basically informing about the page inscription status tracking. So this uh, is, a, uh, is, is a KVM XC map GPA range hypercall. Uh, the host patches for this are already uh, there as part of kernel 5.14. And this goes into KVM uh, and then uh, we have an exit path for this. So it's basically passed through, and there's a KVM exit hypercall exit code, and it passes through to QMU. And then QMU basically, uh, at that point, uh, we basically have a structure where, this is a structure which I was kind of mentioning earlier in the Intel TDX uh, discussion, that we have a shared region list 
uh, which basically tracks uh, uh, the the guest page status, uh, page encryption status. So it's basically GPS star GPN kind of uh, list, interval list. And uh, what we discussed mostly during uh, uh, the patches when they were being upstreamed, uh, and we had long discussions on it, is it's it's probably better to have a shared region list than the bitmap because uh, bitmap one thing would be it's kind of dependent on uh, the guest memory size, uh, the guest RAM size. So it could be for a large, uh, huge guest uh, page uh, size uh, kind of thing. It, it could be a very uh, a large bitmap allocation, and which would be mostly sparsely populated because again, it's the most of the guests will be just having ranges of uh, a small range of memory which is shared, and most of the other memory which is like NMIO memory or uh, things which are which are used for DMA or something like that, or they are specific encrypt pages which need to be kept as uh, decrypted. And uh, most of the other regions of memory are going to be, uh, you know, uh, are going to be uh, private pages, so which are encrypted. So we don't need to really maintain that kind of thing. Uh, and the bitmap remains mostly unpopulated. So uh, uh, it could also cause things like the, uh, the denial of service issues, which we discussed uh, because of the, the large page allocation or something. Uh, or maybe just the, the number of hypercalls coming in and just resizing the page allocation bitmap again and again. So that's that's another thoughts we had. So uh, we decided on something like a shared region list, uh, where, which is more like an interval list, uh, just containing the ranges of memory which are unencrypted or shared between uh, shared uh, by the guest. And both the guest kernel and the guest firmware makes these calls uh, and then exits out to QMU to actually populate or basically insert uh, elements into the disk. Or when they, the pages become encrypted again, they could be just removed from there. Uh, this this uh, this portion of uh, uh, QMU is still under uh, discussion. It's 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 the patches have been posted, but uh, so we, there is uh, there are things to uh, to talk on this and then see if this uh, the implementation looks uh, looks good or not. Uh, so yeah, uh, the next uh, slide basically talks about how does the whole uh, encryption process works. Uh, again, it's based on the slow migration uh, logic, but then uh, portions of this, uh, so as I mentioned, this uh, the, the the page encryption status tracking is also used by the fa fast migration handler. So this is something which is common between both the slow and the fast migration path. So, so we, we so this 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 is something which needs to be you know uh, put in uh, put in concrete in that sense that because it's going to be used for both migration uh, proposals which we have, and uh, and maybe uh, also uh, specifically for Intel TDX uh, in long term. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. So, talking about this uh, migration part. So, uh, so what we basically have is uh, on the QMU side, whenever there is a the the, uh, the, the uh, it's it's the migration. Uh, this is the RAM migration part for sending and receiving encrypted pages. So, so it basically checks uh, the GFN is encrypted. It basically consults the guest share region list, which is already part of the QMU. So, it doesn't need to make any specific in calls into the kernel or up calls into the kernel. It basically, just can track that data, which is directly available to it. Uh, it, it and then uh, what we basically I added was uh, is uh, adding there is already a confidential guest memory support class, and I basically added some memory encryption ops to as part of that. Uh, this is something again uh, which needs to be discussed and decided upon if it's is the right place to put this encryption ops or not uh, in this particular structure. It's this is a kind of a structure which was a confidential guest support class which was added. For confidential guests only, so so it probably made sense to add the the, the specific ops for migration as part of this uh, particular class in QMU, and then it uses the uh, it basically makes an outgoing page call at this point, which gets into an IOC field into the kernel, and then there's a send update data command which I talked about earlier. It goes to the PSP, gets the encrypted data, it's transported to the other side, the target VM, uh, on which this is just the pre-copy path. So uh, the pre-copy path at uh, target PM basically loads the incoming page again makes makes an IOC till call gets into the receiver data data command and the PSP basically at that at that particular point decrypts the data and basically re-encrypts it and puts it in part of the guest RAM. So so that's the, that's how the path works. Uh, all of this this is something which uh, the guest share region list as I mentioned again and probably mention it again that this is this is going to be something which remains common. Uh, between the slow and the fast migration parts which we have. Uh, so just continuing with this further, 
so what we have, uh, these are, th so I just, uh, uh, part of this discussion uh, now just comes to things which we have and things which we want to uh, discuss uh, as part of this microconference and see if uh, we could have some thoughts on what we really want to do uh, as far as uh, the guest kernel and the guest API support uh, patches, which are, which as I mentioned, are still, uh, uh, which are upstream that's still under discussion. So, so what we basically have are uh, uh, some hypercalls which are made earlier than the uh, than the or the apply alternative section uh, part, which is uh, executed as part of setup R. And these pre alternative hypercalls, uh, especially which, as I mentioned, specifically to decrypt uh, the guest kernel sections like DSS decrypted, and then there are specific pages which need to be set as decrypted. And they, uh, they, these are made before they apply alternatives call. So there is a there is a there is a specific issue with this that uh, the default uh, hypercall on uh, x86 platform uh, maps to a VM call, and uh, we specifically want this to uh, this uh, in case of Intel. Uh, sorry, in case of AMD, it has to be the VM call, uh, which is the hypercall instruction. Uh, so so um, so we need we really cannot use the default the uh, hypercall uh, infrastructure and we want to use apply alternatives to set it to VMM call later on but it, it cannot be it, 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 uh, the specific issue comes when uh, we have to make these early hypercalls which are pre alternative so we the, at that time VM call is not ha is not being patched to VMM call so uh, so there has to be some kind of an early pre alternative hypercall interface and uh, 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 what I have been talking about is that we basically have most of the hypercalls are made through an interface uh, which is like early set memory decrypted encrypted interface, which in turn invokes Parabert ops. And uh, what my thought process has been that these early set memory interfaces can be mapped to a specific Parabert op, uh, say like notify page encryption status change, and that gets gets uh, mapped to a specific uh, servo TDX specific hypercall. Uh, so uh, I think I, uh, so. This is one thing I wanted to discuss. Uh, let me just continue uh, complete this thing, and we can just come back to this if uh, uh, if one needs. Uh, the other part of things are how do we basically support and detect the live migration feature? So this is kind of a three-way handshake uh, between the guest kernel, the the host uh, user, and the the, 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 the host KVM side, the KMU side, uh, the guest kernel, and the OVM portion. So uh, it's the guest, the host basically enables the migration feature, and then uh, OVMF detects it and sets up a runtime variable, a UEFI uh, runtime variable for it. And the guest kernel then, at its at the KVM initialization point, uh, the init platform part of the guest kernel basically checks if it's under EFI or not under EFI, and accordingly checks for the UEFI variable support. And then uh, we have a, a custom MSR which basically indicates that the guest has enabled live migration feature. Uh, uh, as of now, the uh, so this is another thing uh, which is still uh, under discussion. Probably needs to have more discussion on this. Uh, again, uh, the, the the migration, the the MSR handling is uh, implemented using the MSR filtering uh, on on TMU, uh, which which probably has been a recent support which has been added, and again gets into TMU to actually do the 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 the, the, the MSR handling and then enabling the live migration feature and. Uh, connecting to the uh, TMU migration code at that particular point. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, as part of the slides, the TMU support basically uh, adds a new confidential guest memory encryption ops. These are the kind of uh, in ops currently which we support. Uh, so we have things where we are basically saving the outgoing page, and uh, uh, we also have the shared region list uh, which I mentioned, this basically has the tracking for the guest page encryption, and uh, to, uh, option and the support to basically migrate uh, uh, the shared region list. And similarly, there is uh, the option to uh, load the uh, shared region list. And so the confidential guest support part, which is already there, has the new memory encryption ops added to it. Uh, again, it's it's something which is probably uh, you know something to be discussed about. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this is the, the EDK side of things. So, so we've been talking about the three-way negotiation feature between hypervisor, guest kernel, and the guest kernel, which I kind of discussed about. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's uh, that's basically uh, concludes my general slides. Uh, now, it's 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 uh, I mean, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, these 
uh, a couple of features which we discussed about. So one has been about how to support the guest kernel and the guest API thing. Uh, the other thing has been uh, the the, hand uh, the the feature enabling part, which is the uh, which is the three-way handshake, and then also, uh, if possible, uh, the, how does the KMU support look like? Uh, is this the right place to add the encryption ops? Uh, so th these are, I think, the uh, kind of a three main discussions to uh, talk about because these are things which probably hold the patches right now for upstreaming. So uh, yeah, so I think so. So just coming to the first part is the guest kernel guest API support. So we've been having discussions on it. Uh, uh, but does anybody have any you know uh, uh, anybody wants to just take up the discussion on this or have thoughts on this, uh, uh, which we which we can discuss further. On. So, uh, for, from the point of view of the QMU migration maintainership, the challenge I have is that we have these two or three different schemes that are all incomplete. So, we have the choice between the um PSP slow migration, which is too slow to be practical. And we have IBM's guest assisted stuff that doesn't yet have some of the features in that we need, like the encryption and the ES support. And then we have the TDX stuff coming as well. So the challenge from the QMU side is to get the bits in that are common and then try and figure out what we can do to get a practical solution rather than three entirely separate things. Okay. Uh, but what about, so there are still some specific common paths, uh, right, which I mentioned, like the, 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 the guest page encryption status tracking, probably the three-way handshake. Uh, these things are probably going to, uh, I understand that slow migration doesn't uh, seem to be a very uh, a long-term path because it's, it's, it's really slow. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something which we know. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so what about the, the common specific common paths, like the guest encryption status tracking? This is some things which will the fast migration path also uses right so we we need to have some some consensus on uh, you know supporting them or at least having them available uh, so what what's what's your thoughts on that yeah I mean, as, I mentioned, as i mentioned like these these these, these uh, the, the specific things like uh, you know the, the okay this is already the past uh, part of the host uh, interface right now it's already been upstream in host so so it's 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 going to remain pretty common uh, for that part. So, but then we have portions which are exiting out to the to QMU side, and then this is something which we maintain right now. But then uh, uh, this is something which is going to be used and varied by the fast migration path also. So, so we uh, we should probably have some consensus on this support and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know see if it, this it is this part can be can be upstream so that, uh, you know, at least the fast migration path can also use it uh, accordingly. I actually checked uh, your previous discussion about uh, the shared region list and, uh, but uh, I saw the discussion was focusing on how to optimize this, but uh, there wasn't any discussion about the difference between the shared region list and the bitmaps. So I'm not sure if uh, everybody has already agreed that you use this or. Well, uh, I, I can... Yeah, I, I think, uh, let, let me give a little bit historical, right? When I started, so this is Brzez, when I started working on live migration, we took the bitmap approach, uh, exactly what, what we you have been saying, is we went with the bitmap approach, but there were many discussion upstream on the KVM mailing list. And the most of the feedback at that point was uh, uh, if you have a large guest or if you're ballooning a guest, then you you will get into all these uh, situations where you're expanding the bitmaps and stuff. 
so the recommendation at that point was, hey, why not just explore other alternatives, so the region list, uh, where we know 99% of the uh, guest memory space is actually a private memory space. So there is no need to maintain that data on the hypervisor, only maintain the data for the shared uh, region. So yeah, if you are interested, I think I can dig up and find you and send you the link for yeah. our discussion, but are they we, all are gave you mailing list. Actually, I already checked those uh, links and the discussions, but uh, I don't think there are lots of discussion talking about the difference. Uh, I, I, I understand what you mentioned there. So, but from design point of view, I think it's it really depends on the guest behavior to decide whether it's shared or private. Guest, uh, like a malicious guest can set each page as private and the next page as shared. And to, in that case, the shared region list will be much more larger, the size will be much more larger than bitmap. For the bitmap, its advantage is that the size is determined when the guest. No, is the guest the, but if you start ballooning the guest, right? If you start uh, even uh, with yeah, with ballooning, the guest uh, its memory is determined when the guest boots, right? Like if we have an eight gig guest uh, and gets booted, so the bitmap size is uh, is determined. So when we do ballooning, uh, we actually just balloon the memory from inside of the guest, like. Uh, the balloon driver like will take uh, like a four gig, but it doesn't affect the bitmap, right? We want to increase the bitmap size, right? The bitmap size is uh, determined when the guest boots. But if, okay, maybe, but if maybe be, I'm missing there, something. There could be other uh, cases, right, where the, the guest size can increase, right? There could be uh, like the hot plug yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah. It's yeah, not just boot that, time, it could be, could be a runtime thing also, right? The hot plug is performed by the hypervisor side, right? Like uh, the the queuing, it's not determined by the guest. So, like uh, if if we if the cloud vendor, they can operate uh, the QMP command to hot plug memory. So that's not decided by the guest. I guess I I guess the confusion over here is uh, in in case of uh, earlier patches, the bitmap was maintained by a KVM in the kernel, but I think way what you are saying is um, bitmap should be maintained in the QMU. Uh, is this my correct? Uh, no, uh, no, 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 it, it's, uh, yeah, it's maintained by KVM, but we can have an option to have this memory be allocated from the guest. Like uh, if the bitmap, like it takes like a one back, for example, so we can have the guest to delete one, one back bytes mm -hmm. memory for this bitmap. So in QMU side, it's pretty so easy to do. Like mm -hmm. if the guest the size is like a, it's a, it's a sixteen gig, so we just uh, use sixteen gig minus one one megabytes, so then the guest realm gets deducted a little bit yeah. from this bitmap. Yeah, I I think I have seen way cases where OVMF BIOS basically clears uh, some of the uh, some of the pages, like a, some MMIO region makes a shared uh, like forty eight bit address space, so really high number. Uh, even they are not part of the guest memory space to begin with. That could be like high MMIO addresses or stuff. And uh, OVMF actually goes and says, hey, I want to mark this entire top of uh, 64 gig as a shared memory region. So you will start getting a request from a guest which says he has high number GPA, make it as a shared. And now you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have memory uh, if you are working with the, uh, working with the bitmap because your guest might have allocated memory only for a guest RAM. It may not have accounted for uh, other unknown uh, GPA yet. Do you mean that uh, OVM, the memory used by OVMF is outside of the range mm -hmm. of the guest yes. RAM size? Yes, yes. So those are, uh, those are uh, one of the thing in, in SCV, I don't know about the TDX, but one of the thing in SCV is all the MMIO memory uh, that need to be mapped, shared, and the MMIOs uh, memory, uh, some of the thing OBM faxes are not part of the guest memory space. They're very high numbers. Uh, so I think I think that's a great example actually. Um, that that is, we, really we can we can really big, right? yeah. yeah, I think we can take this um, um, a discussion online, and I can point you some of the codes. Yeah, probably. I think I can open a discussion even on the mailing list to to have an offline discussion of this one. I think. To list, I can list all the advantages and the disadvantages.
Okay, by the way, for the, for the SCV number, Gushin, I saw you have two proposals. Do you have any performance number to compare? Because you call it a fast, and how fast is it compared to the slow migration? Do you have any initial? Uh, but I think there is, uh, there is really, it's like, it's more like, a, uh, more like an RFC right now. So there's a, there are already, I don't think there are any real numbers for fast migration right now, or even if there are, it's, it's with IBM research guys. Uh, probably they are the right people to talk about it. Uh, a slow migration is quite slow, so uh, that much, that much you know. Yeah, yeah per, a pure slow migration is very slow if you're using the PSP for every page. Um, there is um, the work that IBM's doing that's a uh, pure ingress that doesn't use the PSP at all. And then there's talks also of uh, like a hybrid approach where um, you use the PSP to migrate just like the helper, the migration helper, and then you uh, proceed with fast migration um, from within the guest. Uh, with the migration helper, is it a multi processing support? Like uh, if we have a multi-FT support in QNB, would it, would it be workable to support that? Like, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. okay, so this is an, this is an interesting discussion, but uh, um, I suggest we continue this offline or in one of, or in one of the hack rooms later after the conference. Um, I'd like to move on to the, to the next uh, session, which is uh, TDX Linux support. Andy, you're now presenter. Okay. Um, okay, thank, thank you. Can you, hope you can hear me. Okay, so um, I'm talking about um, the TDX guest, um, and this is just a high level overview, um, <clears throat> because I mean, there's actually a lot of topics, but um, some of them are fairly complicated. There are lots of people who worked on it. So, um, <clears throat> so me and Satya and Kirill and Elena and uh, other people like Shani Sebastian, Isaku, Chao, Casey and others. Yeah. <clears throat> and the original port was actually done by, by Sean Christopherson. Okay, ne next slide, please. Um, I think you can switch. I think you can switch yourself. You are a presenter. Oops, no. How do I do that? Does it work? There should be no. a button down in the middle. I don't see the button. Somehow it's not there. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, no, no, I see. Somehow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so so this is just a, a quick overview. I, I assume most people have already seen something like this. Um, but we, we have like the, uh, the TDX enabled Linux guest, <clears throat> and, and this is, um, you, um, it ha has to be enabled using um, TD calls for power virtualization. Um, and there's also the TDVF, this is the, the guest BIOS, this is based on EDK2, um, at least in the reference implementation. This is also um, in, in, in the trusted guest. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the TDX module, which is, um, is, is an, a module supplied by Intel, which, which um, implements like the, it, it's trusted and implements the um, the trusted policy essentially. <clears throat> that just like sits between the uh, the hypervisor, like KVM or other hypervisors um, and and the guest. Yeah, and then we have, of course have host Linux and then there, there's an underlying CPU. Mm -hmm. And the guest uses TD calls um, <clears throat> to, to do all the, um, the the communication and also shared memory if needed, yeah. And we be using, um, we're using the TD calls to implement um, <clears throat> lots of operations like MSRs, MMIO, PortIO, CPUID, um, most CPUID, and a few other things. Yeah, and and <clears throat> at least in the initial implementation, the IOs for VirtIO, like on KVM, but um, it can't be also different um, for for other hypervisors. <clears throat> yeah, this is the, the basic basic overview. Okay. Um, yeah, just I wanted to talk a little about, about a few topics um, that we are working on. The one thing is we are looking at performance. Um, what we're seeing on the performance front is um, exits that go to the host, they have more overhead than, than in a classic hypervisor. And this is simply because 
they, they go through the TDX module <clears throat> and essentially that it's essentially two exits, yeah? The TDX module, you have an exit to the TDX module and then you have from the TDX module, you have another exit to the host. <clears throat> and obviously this is a little bit more expensive. Um, so, so in general, any optimizations um, that reduce exits are good, yeah? So that we, we, we've been looking at, at various things. For example, one, one thing we noticed is, um, <clears throat> is when you just run something CPU intensive, like 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 which which doesn't do a lot of IO, um, <clears throat> then you you have a little bit of more overhead. Um, and we, we think this is related simply to to the TSC deadline MS Arbeit. Um, <clears throat> because because every time you have a time interrupt there um, it has to reprogram the timer there. So we are thinking actually um, maybe we can use a periodic mode to to reduce that. That would only help when you don't have any other timers, <clears throat> but yeah, this, this this might be a possible solution. But in general, yeah, we, for, for performance we are looking at um, <clears throat> reducing exits as much as possible. Yeah? Um, yeah, and then another issue we, we ran into, we, we see this quite a bit um, on um, on I.O. intensive workloads so is because for us, every I.O. has to go for software I.O. till B. So because um, <clears throat> it, it needs to go to shared memory and we don't want to um, set memory shared and unshared all the time, that would be too expensive. So instead we have this this large pre-allocated buffer in the software I.O. till B. Um, which has been already shared with the host. So in every I.O. Um, which, which has to be shared with the host goes through that buffer. Yeah? And so we're just using the, the legacy software I.O. till B a system which has been traditionally or just used for devices which are less than four gigabyte. Um, and it turns out because traditionally the software utility system was never performance critical because it was only used like as a fallback for slow devices like for USB or things where, where people don't really care that much about performance. Yeah, but now what we're seeing is, um, <clears throat> so for example, especially when you, when you have a couple of vCPUs like eight or 16, um, there's some really bad problems. So we had cases where you, you spent like 20% of the time in um, in spin locks because <laughs> software IOTLB has a single spin lock. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we are we are working on um, there are patch uh, work patches in the work to to split up the spin locks. So essentially, partition the software IOTLB into um, areas um, <clears throat> which have their own spin lock to to and then um, reduce this problem that that they are contending on the same lock. Um, yeah, and it was us. Yes. So, as you know, on the Hyper V side, we had our own um, implementation of uh, bounce buffering for communication with the host. And then, based on the feedback we got from Christoph and others, we are moving towards using uh, the exact same framework that you have for what IO today, the software IO TLB framework for bounce buffering. And we saw about 40% drop in performance between what we had before. Uh, and going into this uh, built-in shared buffer infrastructure you have uh, for software IoTLB. So as you're looking at optimizing this path, um, at least the goal for Microsoft is to get to where we were with our own custom bounce buffering scheme. Is that also something you guys are interested in or are you happy with where you are? Uh, with no, no, like I said, no, we want to be better, yeah? So so I think we are hoping that when once we with our patches, with our optimizations, that that it it it, it won't should should shouldn't give you the forty percent regression that you're seeing. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah, and I suspect that a large part of this forty percent were probably the, the spin lock problems, especially when you have plenty of vCPUs. But the the other problem is um, we, we also saw is if it makes very inefficient use of the of the memory because it actually it cycles through the software to be all the time. It's it's not. It's it's not um, it's not a live it's a FIFO not a LIFO. and this is very inefficient for caches. So there was also we have a patch um, I think it has been already posted um, <clears throat> to to change the software to be to 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 reuse the 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 buffers as quickly as possible, which is much better for the working set. Yeah. So yeah yeah okay, well, we are we are hoping that um, with our patches hopefully we yeah, yeah. <clears throat> this this will fix this problem. Yeah. But um, I mean maybe there's a more, more tuning possible. We have to see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there might, yeah, there, there might be a little bit more work needed to generally optimize this because just traditionally it hasn't been optimized. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Then um, lazy accept. So so Kirill unfortunately is not here. So there's another problem we have is that, um, and I think that's also shared with other implementations. So the all the memory that's used in the guest, um, it has to be accepted by by the guest first. Um, <clears throat> and 
today, um, like in the, in the initial implementation, this was all done in the in the firmware, yeah, so that the firmware accepted all the memory. Um, but it turned out this can be really slow, depending on how much memory you have in the guests. Um, it, it's fairly expensive to to do this, um, and you, you you end up with like r relatively long delays in, in um, at boot, and this is un not acceptable, especially for use cases who want to spin up um, guests very quickly, like for containers and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and um, so what we are looking at is um, lazy accept, and that means there was already quite a lot of discussion on this on um, on Linux kernel and and how to do it. And I think uh, Kirill already posted some patches um, for lazy accept. So essentially, what we are um, <clears throat> what we currently have in our patches is um, so so the, the the there is a change to the to the, to UFI that some memory can be declared as um, not accepted yet, or, or I, think, I think it's got. I think has a different name, but anyways, it's basically not accepted memory. So the parts of the memory, a small part, is it comes out of the UFI firmware, which is already accepted. <clears throat> but then in the memory map, some the larger, the most of the memory is actually not accepted. Um, and then we um, in the in the decompressor, we accept the memory that we need. Um, we're doing this at a two megabyte granality, so we we always accepting a two megabyte range uh, or two megabyte sizes. And then we are maintaining a bitmap. Um, which is also again two megabyte, um, <clears throat> and and yeah, every time we accept something, um, we set it in the bitmap, and this this bitmap is then passed on from the decompressor through the boot protocol to the main kernel, um, and and so on. Yeah, <clears throat> and then the the reason why we need this bitmap is um, um, because the kernel doesn't shouldn't shouldn't accept anything twice because this would be potentially a security risk because if you accept something twice. Um, you, you you might zero it, and I think on my understanding is on AMD it, it causes even other problems. Yeah, so so that the, the bitmap essentially is to keep keep track of um, and has been already accepted. Um, the way it's also implemented is that so once we are in the main kernel and the the mem map is up, um, there's also like an offline bit. We we re, we, we are aliasing it an existing struct page bit, um, and then um, we essentially we have um, hooks into the page allocator, which um, if something is already um, um, is, is not accepted yet or is offline, then then we, we can accept it when, when we allocate the page. Yeah, and this also prevents. Also, uh, there's no need for any exceptions. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's possible for um, in, in the TDX architecture to to have an exception, like when you touch some memory which hasn't been accepted yet and handle it. But uh, the way we implemented it, is, 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 this shouldn't be needed. In fact, we we don't want it. Yeah, because it causes the the, the so-called system call gap. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> so everything is is they're managed in two megabyte, but the the the, the offline bit on the uh, for the memmap is obviously at the 4K level because the the stack page is at 4K level. Um, and actually, that there's an open issue right now. This is still um, needs to be figured out um, <clears throat> how to pass the bitmap to KXEC because the the problem is that we have is that um, shared memory needs a different handling. Um, and right now our uh, our bitmap is only at two megabyte, but the shared memory is not. Um, let's say aligned to two megabytes, so it's, it can be at 4K chunks. So we, we need probably need um, <clears throat> some other some other mechanism to 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 tell the the next kernel if we do KX that uh, the shared memory. Okay, I, I got muted my, somehow. Um, yeah, so so we. Um, Right, so so the the, the, the bitmap, um, yeah. Uh, so we have this problem that that the um, um, right the shared memory needs to be handled specially, but we cannot express it in the bitmap because there's two megabyte granality. So we still need to add some, find some mechanism to 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 pass the shared memory um, also to the KXE kernel so that it can be handled correctly. Um, <clears throat> that's why currently KXE is not not supported yet, but we we hope to fix this at some point. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm I'm just, do we know? Do we know how much, um, how many 4K pages are usually unaccepted, or, or how many pages which are not um, to M aligned? Do you mean how many are shared? Yeah. yeah I mean, we need to handle. We need to handle that over somehow, right? So that information is important. Yeah. So right now we we don't track it. Like the, I mean, no. In theory, it's in the page tables. In theory, you could find it in the page tables, but but there's no count. I think uh, there's no counter anything. But we 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 could we probably need to add some kind of infrastructure to track what what has been shared or not. But actually, that it's actually not a lot of dynamic because 
the, the way our our setup works is that the only thing that's that's really um, uh, shared is the software utility, which is like a 64 megabyte chunk. Um, and then and then we only have a couple of small things which are normally shared, like some a few <clears throat> a co communication things and, and M there are a few MMIO regions. But but it's actually mostly the 64 megabyte plus a couple of pages essentially. So it's not actually a, a, that big a deal. It's not that it's like a lot of memory or a lot of different regions, but but it still has to be done somehow. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so, all of this, all of this stuff really sounds, sounds like a lot of lot, lot of hoops to jump through with like passing down bitmaps all the way through the whole kernel boot boot up phase. Um, is that actually necessary? Like, uh, why don't we just go in and say we always have um, a, a one gigabyte uh, region that is um, declared as as memory, and then everything above that one gigabyte range just gets declared as uh, needs to be accepted memory. And then the kernel just can boot within that one gig, and everything beyond that it just uh, accepts lazily or, or uh, installs lazily as soon as it uses it. Um, when the so I think it would be actually um, okay for TDX, but it was apparently a showstopper for AMD. We had this discussion um, because on TDX it would be okay because um, um, it, it has to be tracked during a single when the kernel is the main kernel is running. Um, because because otherwise the, the the hypervisor could replace some memory regions with zeros, which would be a, a security attack. But but when you are actually cake seeking, um, <clears throat> then then it it's it's usually okay to replace stuff with zeros, yeah, at least one time, yeah. Um, so the, in TDX it would have been it would be acceptable, I think. But so we had this discussion on this panel, but it turned out that on AMD it, it causes I think Jörg pointed out it causes some other problems. So we we, we have to really track everything, right? Right, Jörg? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you must on AMD you must make sure that you don't accept twice so other, everything else would be a security issue and you have to track this information across KXX. Mm -hmm. I, okay, let's let, let's take those two conversations um, separately. Okay, let, 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 let's try to just talk about booting and KXing as, as separate things. Uh, I think you already concluded that for KXing you need to have additional information where you actually have to describe on a 4K granularity where, where pages are shared and so on and so forth. Like, like KXing is a completely different beast. But just for booting, um, like how, how far along are you with the patches to do the two Mac dances and, and pass that along the whole boot chain? Um, I'm, I'm no, we, to, we have, we have to, the, the patches have, have been posted. Yeah, the Kirill has a patch kit, it's on Linux kernel. Um, so, so we, we have full patches. The only the only thing we are missing essentially is um, is is the um, the, the KXX handling. And I think there was recently um, they found a bug that sometimes we we have a <clears throat> we have some so sometimes when on the depending on the memory layout we have a crash. We also still need to fix that. But um, but um, I mean in principle that the patches are already implemented and they're actually not that bad. You can take a look at them. I, I can post the link here. Um, so yeah, so it, it sounds sounds complicated, but it's not that complicated. Yeah, yeah. And the and the yeah. problem with and the problem with pre-accepting like say one gig of memory is that um, your address space layer randomization will then put the kernel within this uh, first gigabyte of memory, and then you lose some bits for, of the of the randomization. So what you need is support for unaccepted memory in the decompressor, which actually does the physical placement of the kernel in the memory. And if you have that, you can also go and say, hey, everything besides what the BIOS tells you is unaccepted and go ahead and accept it as you need it. So, fair enough. Yep. So, Thanks. He, uh, is there any reason not to uh, accept more than two meg uh, when we get the hint that pages need to be accepted? The reason why I'm bringing this is in case of SNP, uh, the, when we do the page state change, basically when we accept the memory, there is two step process. One is uh, uh, exit to the hypervisor uh, to add the page in the RMP. And when we exit to the hypervisor, uh, we can actually batch up a lot of entries. Uh, so we can batch up more than two meg. We can batch up all the way up to 500. So we can say, okay, take one exit, go and add the RMP entry for up to 500 megabytes. Yeah, I mean, you, you could do that if you want, but I mean, just a bitmap is a two megabyte, but you, you can do it in larger chunks. Um, however, the, the, the problem is if you do it in two large chunks is you might end up with too much latency because because often people care about a, a latency during runtime, like, you know, tail latencies. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I suspect if you do it in too large, then um, um, it, it, there will be problems. For us, um, our API is, um, is, is currently only up to two megabyte, um, and there's no batching at this point. 
So, so we, we are kind of restricted to, to megabyte. Um. And remember that the current patches are doing this in the page allocator. So you can go do 100 terabytes at once, but you, somebody's waiting on a page to come back for that yeah. to happen. So you don't want to make it too long, is what Andy said. Uh, about right, right, right. I think there might also be spin lock issues. Yeah. So, so, so you have to be careful with too long latencies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Any, any other thoughts or comments on this one? Um, okay. Um, the next slide. Security. So there's a, first I should add, um, there's actually Elena has a separate, uh, much longer talk on this, which is going much more detailed at the Linux Security Summit. Um, yeah, but I'm just giving you like a high level overview um, what we're doing. So this is actually one of the the, the, la the largest challenges we have or the, the most work. <laughs> um, yeah, so in general, I mean, the, the problem we have is right, um, that the guest is protected, like its memory is protected and its registers are protected. Um, but it still has um, all these touch points with the host, yeah? So it communicates um, for MMIO, for MSR, for, for some MSRs, not for all of them, um, and, and, and um, for, for shared memory, um, for virtio, and a couple other things, yeah? So, and essentially, because the host is untrusted, this is essentially, um, I think of it like, it's, it's like being a server on a hostile internet, yeah? So you have some ports open and somebody can attack you, yeah? So, so and you have to, to make sure that, um, I mean, if, if you are unlucky and and the code, um, let's say, has a buffer overflow which passes some data, then 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 they they, they could um, use that to to let's say um, <clears throat> find some some primitive in, in your code and then actually read all the memory. So all the memory encryption and, and memory protection wouldn't help you if, if they can basically take over um, you using these communication points. Yeah. So it's really uh, really important that that we we, we secure this. Yeah. So we have to. Um, Right, we have to make sure. And the, the, the challenge is also that traditionally Linux always has trusted the underlying hardware, yeah? So that because essentially from the point of view of the kernel, this is all hardware, yeah? And and no, none of this code really has been written to to assume that um, <clears throat> that that the, the underlying hardware is trying to attack you or be malicious and so on, yeah? I, I should add, there's a little bit of, of prior art here um, for on the client side. Um, because because they have this problem with malicious USB or Thunderbolt devices, yeah. So there was a little bit of work there for for hardening some drivers, but but not very much, yeah. <clears throat> and a, a lot of the stuff we are, we are hardening. I think we we actually looked at it. We we, we built some tools um, to to look for all the places. I mean, there there are really thousands, or in some cases tens of thousands of places um, <clears throat> in the kernel where which can potentially communicate with the host and, and and process some data and so it's really it's really frightening somewhat um <clears throat> yeah anyways but but our strategy for this is um first disabling as much code as possible um so we 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 are actually we have, we have quite a few patches um to just get rid because a lot of uh, uh, communication bots are actually not needed they're like for some obscure feature which we which is not virtualized so we, we don't care about um, <clears throat> so we actually disabling a lot of code to just make sure that um, it's, it doesn't even run, so we don't need to audit it or harden it. Um, for that, I mean, the, the biggest problem, of course, is all the drivers, yeah? And obviously, I mean, Linux has like um, hundreds of thousands of drivers, like millions of lines of code. That there's no way you can harden all of this, yeah? And there's an obvious attack where um, like a malicious hypervisor which controls the PCI config space could find some driver which has a buffer overflow and then just um, <clears throat> Uh, ML, uh, uh, pre present the PCI ID of that of that device, and then get UDEV to load the driver, and then exploit the driver, and then export the guest. Yeah. So so what we um, <clears throat> but of course it doesn't make sense because most of these drivers we don't care about. They're they're not they're never used usefully in, in a guest, right? We only want Virtio <laughs> and maybe um, some other drivers for let's say VM bus or something, but but not um, <clears throat> like the vast majority or 99.9% .9 of the drivers. Yeah. So what we um, been working on is we have a, a device filtering framework and um, at the device layer uh, uh, um, at the, 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 the this driver central driver layer um, but essentially we, we have an allow list of a very small list of drivers which is mostly virtio um, <clears throat> or, or pretty much only virtio um, <clears throat> and then only drivers which have been actually audited and hardened uh, they get allowed. Uh, um, they get allowed in the list, and everything else cannot even uh, probe. Yeah. So, so we, we prevent prevented that the driver model um, <clears throat> to 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 load. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there was already like an initial patch uh, posted there um, by Satya, but um, the initial version Greg didn't like. He wanted also um, more unification with the existing work in the USB stack, um, which also has as a concept of a of an authorized device, which is used a bit similar that. 
you have only audited USB devices to, to prevent USB attacks. Um, so actually, um, Satya has been reworking the patches, and we have been reworking the patches um, several times. And I think we are, we are getting ready to to repost them soon with the new version. Is that right, Satya? Satya? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the patches are uh, near completion, so we'll be mm -hmm. posting. Yeah. So 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 we have right. We have a new version which is um, uses pretty similar infrastructure um, as, as the existing USB. So essentially, it, it generalizes the existing USB authorized concept. And <clears throat> based on that one, we have our, our allow list. We, we can inject when we are running in TDX. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, and that this, this prevents like the, the vast majority of drivers to, to load. Yeah. Hey, Andy, so this particular framework you're talking about is it should be a, an allow list where you go and statically add new drivers that you think you trust. Yeah, uh, yeah. Currently, uh, we kind of uh, have a static list for uh, TDX, uh, but we also added a, a command line option uh, uh, for like extending that list. Yeah, yeah. Kiv, I, I should add the idea is not to prevent anybody from. I mean, if, if you have a driver which you want to support, yeah, um, yeah. You're, you're, you're happy to do that. Um, so, but it's just. What we want you to do is to audit and harden it first, yeah, and then add it to the allow list. Yeah? Right, right, right. So yeah, so yeah. You would yeah. Harden it first, or harden the first before adding yeah. it to the list. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and so, so, right, this is the song. But I should add there are a couple more problems. So, first, there are various um, things which are outside the, uh, the driver model. For example, in the early x86 code, there's some early PCI and there, there are quirks and other things. So we actually we have quite a few patches, which are mostly pretty simple. It's just a few lines. If if we are in, in the um, <clears throat> in the confidential guest mode, then 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 don't do this. Or, or so, so we have uh, some some other patches for for things which are outside the the, the standard device model. Um, there are some other issues. For example, there. Because the, the way a, a normal a driver loads is um, so there's an like an init function which is called by init call or by module init, um, and in many cases like especially with legacy drivers those um, they sometimes do already communication with the host yeah or they, they try to do something like they probe something they I/O remap something they probe something, um, <clears throat> and this would be in principle already attack points because in principle you there, there could be already buffer flow in this early code and this unfortunately cannot be prevented by the driver model because it doesn't really control the module in it or doesn't control the um, the, the init calls. Um, so so what we also have you have some extra extra defense mechanisms. Um, so one for example for the I/O ports, um, we we have a, a hard coded allow list. We, we expect this is probably um, because I/O ports are. A really legacy, so that there's not much need for extending this. Um, and for also for IO remap, um, because for us the IO remap only works when um, when it's set to shared. Yeah. So, so if you have an IO remap region, you actually have to set to shared. Um, <clears throat> and originally uh, we had a policy where every IO remap was automatically shared. Um, but now we we switch. I mean, we 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 actually we switch to that you have to actually declare the IO remap to be shared. And it turned out for us it was only like two. Two places in the kernel which we actually need to change there, and everything else um, <clears throat> we, we don't set to share. It and this actually the the communication doesn't work. Yeah, in fact, it's a little bit ugly, unfortunately, uh, because what happens is that that you you upload on the host level because when you do an M MMIO there, the the host notices it and notices that I cannot handle it, and then it has to essentially kill the guests. So this is a, um, is not very nice error handling, <laughs> but but we ex because we expect this can this shouldn't really happen in practice, right? This is um, um, or if it happens, it's a security attack. So, so you think you're okay with it. But I should add, we also have um, <clears throat> we, we have command line options to override this. So if somebody wants to actually do IO remap or let's say add more drivers, so there are command line options to add more drivers to the allow list and command line options to um, to override the, the policy of of making IO remap shared. So it's possible to do that, but it has some security risk because if you uh, make all the IO map shared, then then everything that's in the init call and it might be might be called and it hasn't been audited might be attacked. Yeah. So there, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah they're, they're okay, so um, I think we are up for a break now. So yeah. um, to finish this discussion, I would like to mention that tomorrow in the uh, testing and fuzzing micro conference, there's a session about device driver fuzzing. So um, everybody who's interested in that can attend that as well. Device driver fuzzing is about finding bug, finding actually the bugs in, in device drivers and, and hardening them. Um, so, and with that, I th 
you're going into a 10 minute break. So let's go to our next uh, topic, debug support for confidential guests. Ashish, you're now a presenter. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, so the next uh, thing we're gonna discuss is debug support for confidential guests. Uh, uh, again, the discussion is generally more about uh, specific to SCV, the platform I work in, but uh, there are specific uh, TBX patches on top of the SCV patches, so I would probably also bring it up uh, during the flow, uh, during one of the flow charts down here. So uh, uh, it's uh, uh, as we already have been discussing, the encrypted guest, uh, the, uh, the VM has its uh, memory, and pro maybe the, in our case, uh, only after SCV ES, the register context also encrypted. Uh, by specific technologies uh, like AMD SCB or Intel TDX. And uh, because it's encrypted, it breaks down uh, QMU's built-in debugging features as it cannot directly do uh, guest memory access, specifically things like mem copy from the host virtual address or something. So so we've been, uh, it's, this discussion is generally more about uh, implementing a basic framework of, and a common x86 implementation to say, say handle uh, encrypted guest memory, read writes, uh, and specifically the support TMU's built-in debugging features uh, like the monitor command or the GDD stub. Uh, so again, talking about, uh, uh, so this discussion is generally more about the QMU debug support required for confidential VMs or guests. And uh, again, uh, the AMD security processor uh, uh, specifically has a specific uh, key management APIs like uh, which basically allows you to decrypt or encrypt uh, the guest memory. So you have debug, decrypt, and debug encrypt PSP commands, uh, which allow decryption and encryption of guest pages. Uh, yeah, we do have a guest policy, which uh, also uh, can be set in case we want the VM to be to be to be debugged. Uh, so it's this is the kind of implementation. Uh, uh, these are very implement, implementation specific notes on the QMU side about things uh, which have been done as part of the patches. Uh, so the the, the mem PX attributes uh, structure has been uh, a new specific bit field added to indicate that this mem B access is from a debugger. Uh, this is the basic first patch, and then. Uh, uh, on, a, on the on the very uh, top level interface, you have something like CPU memory read write debug, which is the main interface function called uh, whenever uh, there is a virtual memory access, uh, uh, a guest virtual memory access from QMU side. So this is something which needs to be uh, overloaded with some vendor specific assist or hook for debug access to guest memory. Uh, so we need uh, in, we added a new memory debug ops hook, uh, a new memory debug ops structure which basically hooks into this. Uh, CPU memory read by debug interface, and also the physical memory side of uh, debug interfaces to basically uh, allow uh, 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 and basically do read writes to guest uh, memory, uh, uh, which is encrypted. And uh, so, so main functions are the read and write side uh, functions uh, or the callbacks. And there's a PTE mask, which is uh, specific to SCV uh, for page table booking. Uh, I, uh, there's a little bit more chat on it. Uh, so, uh, so if you see uh, CPU memory read write debug kind of has been modified. It sets the memory PX attributes accordingly, and instead of making direct calls to address, so this is the address uh, CPU memory read write debug is the QMU's main uh, function used for the address space read writes. Uh, so instead of making direct calls to address space uh, read and write functions, it now goes to this memory debug ops uh, structure which we added and uh, uh, makes and makes a specific callbacks to those read and write commands instead of making direct uh, address state read write calls. So that's that's one of the main things it does. On top of this, uh, the, uh, it, the memory region itself, the QMU memory region itself needs to be overloaded with, uh, because it currently uses uh, a mem copy to, uh, which I talked about earlier, a mem copy from HVA to do specific uh, uh, guest memory read writes. So again, uh, 
there is a new structure added, memory region RAM, read write ops, which basically has just two callbacks. And uh, in the memory region now basically improves this uh, uh, this structure as uh, RAM debug ops. Uh, so this is the change uh, from the memory region side of things. So how does this flow for, how does this API flow for ACB guests? Uh, I have a generic slide uh, for it on how, uh, on the Intel patches on top of this. Uh, but then what we see is uh, just basically right now and we will see what, uh, what the generic patch is. So, so you have the, the main virtual interface, uh, virtual memory read function call, and it maps into the memory debug ops uh, callback, which in, uh, basically makes an SED specific call. And then we added some uh, read write debug helpers. Uh, so you basically internally invoke the address space read debug, which now instead of making a direct uh, call to uh, uh, to memory, which in, uh, earlier this was just a mem copy code, but now this uh, specific read write help, debug helper checks if it's uh, the debug in, uh, it's, it's a debug access and you have the callbacks for that and invokes the, uh, the memory region specific callbacks on, on top of that. So that's why you, you need uh, an address space uh, uh, hook and a memory region hook which uh, work in a coordinated way uh, to finally call back into uh, SCD or a TDX specific uh, interface to read uh, or write yes memory. In case of SCD, this would just map to, uh, as, we, as we see in the next slide, it maps to basically uh, uh, an IOCTL uh, going into the into the KVM side, which uh, will basically uh, use the SCD API, which I talked about earlier, bigger encrypt or debug decrypt to uh, basically encrypt or de decrypt of this uh, guest memory uh, at that particular point. Uh, so, uh, so we do add it. Uh, so these are just the virtual memory side of things. For the physical memory read write APIs, uh, there's been new specific uh, interface functions added. So they have been like all the CPU physical memory read write debug. And uh, then there's been uh, the reading uh, or a long or a keyword uh, specific uh, interface. So, which again internally invokes the new memory debug op structure. So, so the changes are, uh, you need to make uh, specific uh, changes in the QMU code whenever it's accessing guest memory. For example, if there's a TLB info thing, which will be invoked as part of the GDB uh, stuff in or the monitor command, it will, instead of making a CPU mem physical memory read, now it falls into CPU physical memory read debug. So, that's that's so that's where one of these APIs get used uh, if I'm uh, in, uh, the guest page table walk again there is uh, specific hooks needed because uh, the uh, when we you are basically going to read the page table entry uh, you will have to see it set uh, in case of the SCD guest so you will uh, we basically have to mask that uh, see bit to get a to get the right or the true physical address. And uh, we again uh, go through the debug ops. Uh, this is the PP mask callback, which I had, uh, which we had uh, just, uh, kind of uh, seen earlier. So uh, this one. So this basically gets the the right C bit or the, the right C bit position uh, uh, in case of uh, for SCB guests, and then uh, the mask is applied accordingly. Uh, similarly, the, the page table work continues for PDs and PTs accordingly. Uh, there's a, a, a specific uh, uh, handle to uh, to do MMU guest MMU lookup or the page table walker. Uh, we I have basically have a translate callback for it, but right now it's not currently used. Instead of uh, using that translate function or the callback, we basically just override the CPU class to a uh, CPU class uh, page attribute debug handler to, to point to the uh, SCD specific uh, callback, callback to do the page table work. Uh, this is more of an, uh, a top level uh, diagram, just shows the complete relationship between the APIs and interface being added. It kind of uh, uh, is, again, this is basically based on Top of the Intel patches on uh, top of the SCD, uh, the, the SCD, Intel patches just were pushed on top of the SCD patches. So, so if you see uh, from a top level point of view, this is the one which is doing the page table working. It internally invokes uh, the uh, physical read write debug functions. Uh, they go through the debug ops, 
For a normal guest, they just get mapped into address space, read and write ROM, which will internally then in turn invoke memory region and just do a mem copy or something. But in case of uh, uh, an encrypted guest, they get into debug ops, uh, and then uh, if it's it's an encrypted guest, they get mapped into the specific helpers, the debug and ROM, write debug helpers. Uh, they go through, the, uh, they basically uh, get the memory region uh, uh, and then the memory region, it's because the attributes are set and the RAM debug ops callback is available. It calls back into uh, KVM encrypted guest read write memory functions, which will map to either set IOC, IOC tool for CV and uh, uh, KVM VM IOC tools for, uh, for TDX guests. And this is for the physical side of things for for the virtual side, the similar code path is used for it's the CPU memory read write debug is the main uh, main uh, function for all virtual memory access. So again, just goes through the same path from uh, from top level from the address space handler to the memory region handler, and then uh, uh, goes into uh, specific IOC two paths, which uh, will invoke the PSP to uh, in case of SCV invoke the PSP to get uh, decrypt and encrypt the, uh, the guest memory. Uh, specifically, uh, and so uh, so th this is generally about the all about the the memory side of things. Uh, but as I mentioned that, and probably that's also true for TDX that SCV ES uh, also encrypts the register state, and uh, which the CPU is the state. So that is uh, still uh, that's that's a limitation of this uh, of the whole interface currently because uh, in specifically in case of SCV there is no. Uh, no way to directly get, uh, uh, there is no self uh, SCV key management API, which basically allows you to debug or, uh, or decrypt the register state uh, in that sense. So, so you, I mean, this, this is something which is, uh, which needs to be explored. Uh, and this currently is a limitation. So accessing um, uh, CPU register state as part of uh, the QMU debugging interface or even as, uh, doing device accesses. So, so you might have issues while uh, QM, for QMU device emulation that device access may not work because the register state is encrypted. So, so they are, uh, they are, these are things which are still open-ended. Uh, we need just need to see what is what what can be done for this. Probably need some kind of guest awareness. Uh, is there a possible way to probably do a virtual intra, uh, virtual debug or trap or a debug intrap injection at that time? And then does it need some kind of VC handler or the GHCP is a specific SEV structure for guest and host communication. So, uh, so th this, this does need some kind of guest awareness where uh, the guest needs to uh, basically supply back, uh, get, get, get the decrypted register state back as to the, to the KMU side or the host side uh, using the GHCP, uh, uh, GHCP structure. And then uh, that's where the KMU can pick it up and, uh, you know, uh, uh, do these specific things, uh, which I uh, which I talked about. So, yeah. So this is uh, these these are patches. Uh, 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 as I mentioned, have been uh, uh, submitted by uh, by, uh, by us, uh, yeah, the indie guys, and then uh, until uh, push the patches on top of that. So, uh, it's it, it, there's been a limited discussion on it. Uh, they are still um, uh, kind of open-ended uh, patches, uh, and uh, uh, so. We, uh, so, so the point here is to if, if there is uh, anything which we can discuss about it right now here or are there any general comments about it or any specific comments about it uh, that we can probably discuss right now uh, yeah. hey ashish yeah is there a chance to get the the register state debugging uh, feature before the memory debug ops because that's i i consider pretty important for doing any ES development or SMP development. Uh, yeah, but as of now, there is uh, like as I mentioned, there is no uh, uh, there is no direct support for it in hardware, right? Uh, so, so that that, that this is completely an open-ended thing right now. There, the, the patches don't address this right now. So it's it's uh, so so. so well, the, they have, well, the, yeah. the the PSP can can decrypt the register state, right? If debugging is enabled for the VM. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah. uh, for Tommy, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, the, the, the problem that you run into is where, where do you, um, 
you know, if you're you're in debug handling or 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 entering uh, breakpoints, you're typically in the VC handler, right? So now it's the VC handler that has a PT reg struct, and it's those regs that are there that need to be communicated back to the uh, to the the debugger, right? So it's 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 not. It's not that you'll be able to to stop right on on the instruction when you have like in the case of ES, and and then you have to take into account. Okay, so how do you convince the guest? How does the guest ensure and and is positive that debugging is actually allowed in his policy? And and you know, and so we would have to we'd have to work something through there. I'm not sure that we have that. Uh, capability under ES to be able to to do that. Yeah, Maybe but, under SNP, we might be able to 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 have like a guest command or something. Yeah, the the guest needs to be aware that, uh, or the guest needs the attestation report to know that it's being able to debug. But still, for for some exits, like or actually for all automatic exits, it would be it would be useful to have um, you have the decryption when it's but when it is enabled in the policy. So what what yeah. what usually happens when you when you when I develop um, ES code and it crashes very early, then I get a shutdown or something like that, and or it just um, stops executing. Yeah, I mean because it, it's it, it ends up in some loop. So yeah, I I know uh, that's kind of how I I did a lot of debugging too. You know, as long as it's an automatic exit, right, where you're not coming through. Um, you know the VC handler, right? Then you will have the regs at that state, and then then you could uh, decrypt the VMSA at that point if the policy is is set to allow that. Um, I know both you and I use that quite a bit. Yeah, right. But it's still the out of tree debug patches, and it would be great to have something upstream, right? Yeah, it might be something we could do that, you know, as long as you're not in the VC handler. So if you do get a, a shutdown, you can look and see what, what your register state is. So I can uh, I can work with uh, Ashish on that when, uh, uh, when he gets back to the office here soon. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, I think with the CVES, uh, another thing is, yeah, we may be able to uh, decrypt the VMSA, but we will not be able to update uh, VMSA if somebody is using the GDB type of functionality to set the register values and stuff, then uh, that will not work with the CVES. Right. right. But with, I think with the SNP, um, uh, we will not have those limitations. So. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, I think we can move on to the next um, session. So maybe to give Samuel some time to, to sort the audio out. Um, Jacob, can we probably switch the talks? Because you are the, you are the next. Uh, yeah, we could. Um... We could. Uh, so then we all can can sort out the 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 audio issues, and then we have um, this talk afterwards. I know that you prefer to be after Samuel, but yeah. Yeah, this is unfortunate. It's it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Okay. I will I will then, introduce some things that I thought he would introduce, but it doesn't matter, honestly. Okay, then. Um, let me see where I have the list. So you should be a presenter now. I'm a presenter, right? Uh, and here's slides. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, my name is Jakob Nauke. I work in cloud development for Linux and OpenShift on IBM Z and Linux One at IBM. And I want to talk a little about uh, confidential computing on IBM Z with secure execution uh, and the challenges uh, that we're looking at, especially with uh, confidential containers. Um, and so, yeah, IBM Z, Linux One, uh, or I might just say uh, IBM Z through this talk, 
um, you may traditionally know as the mainframe, uh, the S390X uh, architecture, and it is, among other things, used for Linux and Red Hat OpenShift workloads. Um, and IBM Secure Execution for Linux is uh, the hardware confidential computing backend that we have um, that's been introduced uh, with the latest model, Z15, in 2019. Um, and it is always based on virtualization with Linux and KVM, so like uh, SCV and TDX, and also protected execution facility on power. Um, it is always on, on virtualization level, so no application level. Uh, and uh, the, the sole problem, or well, one problem at least, uh, that these confidential computing technologies always need to solve um, is making sure that a workload really runs in a secured context like uh you're you have a supposedly secure domain uh at i don't know a cloud provider and you want to uh, i don't know ssh into it you want to make sure uh that they're really running what they're supposed to or that they really running what you gave them if you gave them something um because if they could inject something that would be an open door for malware right um and the way that uh, SCV and TDX uh, achieve this is generally through attestation, uh, pre-attestation or runtime attestation, uh, and perhaps uh, smaller encrypted key containers. Um, secure execution and also PEF go a slightly uh, different uh, route. Um, they have a fully encrypted boot image uh, that can house pretty much anything you want. Um, and it's encrypted um, with an asymmetric key or an asymmetric key that chain loads a symmetric key. Um, and that asymmetric key is tied to the machine uh, that you want to run on. So basically, based on serial number, um, you have um, a key, a public key to encrypt your boot image with. Um, and that is basically the, the, the root of trust in running a secure execution guest. Um, only, only this machine could ever decrypt this image and therefore launch it. Um, but the problem that you have to, that you have to solve now is uh, retrieving uh, that private key for decryption. Because um, if, if the hypervisor could just read it, then you haven't really uh, gained anything. Then a rogue admin, hypothetical admin with root access could still get that key and do malicious things with it. Um, and that's where what we call the ultravisor um, comes in. So the ultravisor is implemented in hardware and firmware. Um, and when you boot a secure execution guest, um, the hypervisor will immediately reboot to the ultravisor. Um, and that will be able to decrypt the secure image um, and will handle guest memory pages. Um, and those will not be available to KVM or Kimu or other Linux processes. Um, and uh, I.O. still remains visible, of course, um, also power consumption and scheduling. Um, but um, and so th those should be encrypted. I.O. should be encrypted. Um, but uh, register contents and memory contents are undumpable. Um, so just to reiterate a little um, what the uh, what the workflow would look like um, in, in classical secure execution, um, you need to bootstrap um, a Linux system uh, on trusted IBM Z hardware, um, and that would use Lux or disk, some sort of disk encryption, because remember, I.O. remains unprotected. Um, and you would have a kernel and a command line, um, and an init RD, and you put, would put the key to that um, Lux root FS into the init RD. Um, this may seem a bit counterintuitive because now you're shipping um, the root FS with the key to it. Um, but what you do is you create this uh, secure image. Um, so that's uh, with, with checksums. Um, and now because only, only the machine that you use, whose key you used here um, can decrypt this, uh, this, is, this is the way you know that the, uh, that the workload is really secured. Um, and this may be fine um, if you want to run a normal uh, secure execution uh, virtual machine. Um, this may be fine, um, but uh, you might want to run something else. You might want to run containers. Um, 
and the challenges that we have there I want to talk about a little. So um, where I primarily work uh, is the CATA, communers, CATA containers community, sorry, um, that Samuel will also talk about. Um, and CATA containers, basically, um, we run um, uh, we run our pods as tiny VMs. So it's OCI compatible. Um, you can use it with container D and the likes, um, but um, the actual containers run in tiny VMs um, that are based on different hypervisors. Um, and we have a CATA component on the host that is that talks to container D or that is talked to by container D. Um, and that can talk to a component in the guest that we call the agent. Um, and that can launch uh, one or more uh, containers. So yes, this is the sandbox. It has its own kernel and everything. And uh, Kata Containers um, slogan sort of uh, is having the speed of containers, but the security of VMs, um, because it's you know it's as fast as virtualization is on your platform, which is generally pretty good. Um, and launch times are a little slower than a traditional Run C container, um, but um they're reasonably fast or actually very fast for uh, for a vm like ballpark of, of one second or maybe a little even a little less um and you you get the security guarantees of vms you get some things uh, that you don't necessarily get uh with uh, with c groups uh and namespaces so um isolating guests so they can't possibly break out is uh, is one use case, uh, but another is using um, confidential computing technologies uh, that are based on virtualization, obviously, like secure execution. Um, so um, this is uh, this is also a, a community effort. Uh, very little of this is my own work, but um, we in the CATA community we're currently looking at enabling. Um, confidential computing technologies um, with this. So um, utilizing the hardware uh, is one step. This is uh, generally done for, for all major um, virtualization-based technologies uh, and locking down the agent. So it doesn't just do anything that the host component, the runtime tells it to. Um, this is currently being looked at by Samuel, who I, I think will talk a little bit more about this. Um, but uh, one one core problem uh, that we want to solve um, with confidential containers is running a an encrypted container image because um, that's uh, that might very well be what you want. You have a you have a custom encrypted container image that probably contains some other secret that you use to connect to an API endpoint. Um, and we will initially um, or in current development. Uh, we are uh, pulling this uh, image upon creating a container. Um, and the, the core problem you have to solve now is uh, getting the key to decrypt it. Um, and this is where, uh, where SCV and TDX uh, can use their various methods of attestation um, to receive a key at runtime. Um, but um, which, uh, or at least in later generation, SEV SNP can also use a runtime attestation uh, to establish a secure channel um, to, to retrieve keys. Um, but because uh, secure execution and also PEF um, do not have attestation in that sense of the word, because they don't require attestation in that sense of the word, um, we can go, uh, or I see currently, uh, two slightly different routes uh, that we may go. Um, so the um, one one approach uh, is what I like to call the bacon approach, um, where you would have um, an init RD with a cater agent and an attestation agent, which is also a component that's being developed right now for um, for attestation. But um, we will simply use it without it actually doing attestation. Um, but uh, simply using offline baked in keys for decrypting containers or container images, um, which is very simple because it does not require any external component running uh, at runtime, um, but it's not very flexible because you're stuck um, with the keys that you put in there. And when you want to uh, reroll these keys, um, you will have to build a new init RD. Um, and the other is what I like to call uh, the key fetch approach, 
um, which is going to be a little more akin to what SCV and TDX do because they they talk to a guest owner proxy at runtime, which has to run on trusted hardware and which can provide keys um, for container image decryption. Um, and because it uses gRPC, um, we can simply uh, secure that connection uh, with TLS. Um, hey, so you, uh, yes. What's the role of the attestation agent in the baking approach? Um, very little. Um, basically, um, it so be, because all the architectures are going to use the attestation agent, um, I'm, we will use it too because then integration is easier. But what it will more or less do is it'll it'll receive um, a container image um, that's going to be encrypted. Um, this is also going to use OCI crypt, um, or OCI crypt Rust. Um, and for uh, for retrieving the key, uh, what it will normally do, or what it will do on SAV and TDX, is use their secure channels, and instead it will just um, read uh, from a file or from from an offline key. If that makes okay. sense. Yep. Okay. Um, and the key fetch approach, um, we will we will connect in to an endpoint, um, but uh, we will use. Uh, a, a TLS certificate that will be baked in instead, which is a bit more flexible because you can now reroll um, container image keys, and you will only need to redo that in NetRD um, when you need to renew uh, the certificate and the key. Um, so that's basically a, a substitute for runtime attestation. So about development, um, the uh, the all the core hardware technologies are enabled. Um, this bacon approach um, is going to share uh, some work uh, with SEV or first generation uh, SEV um, because um, that with its um, pre attestation workflow there will be some similarities. Um, and I also want to work on the key fetch approach. Um, and one other thing that I want to look into in the future um, is building these init RDs without requiring trusted IBM Z or Linux One hardware, because obviously it would be a bit more convenient if you could do that on commodity hardware, um, which is probably going to require some uh, cross building um, and or emulation. Um, but I have uh, yet to really look into that. So yeah, um, thank you for listening. Um, just quickly, so the trademark info is here. Um, you, we can discuss uh, other approaches if uh, if you think, or Kata's overall model, or more questions about secure execution, um, whichever you like. I also see there's something in in the shared notes. Um, our TCB recovery work in a model where we just have a SNKDF pub key. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with all the abbreviations that you use there. I, I'm aware of TCB. Maybe you can speak up or, or edit them in. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, one second. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, I, I, I can cover this in a minute, sorry. Serial number, ah, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, key derivation function, yeah. Um, So the the question is around uh, TCB recovery, which is uh, this process. So basically, if you discover a vulnerability uh, in uh, in the microcode and or some, in some lower level parts of the of your TCB, um, then uh, in in a case of Intel SGX, they have a specific process for basically upgrading a microcode, patching the vulnerability, uh, and this and the upgrading. Uh, in a way which is uh, visible in the attestation. So actually you can prove that the TCB is upgraded and safe. Uh, and then uh, I guess the question is, uh, how do you do this if you don't, if you don't do attestation and like how, how do you actually do recovery in cases of uh, discovered vulnerabilities? 
Okay, okay. Um, I I do have to admit, I, I primarily work uh, in, in CATA containers and it's uh, secure execution um, enablement. Um, I think uh, this is being looked at at the moment, um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure, I have to admit. I see, thanks. Hi, I mean, I'm not an expert here either, but the key element I think to this is that because there is an aspect of image encryption, then there is the opportunity that suggests that any update could form the path of rolling keys and things like that. So if you have um, an encrypted image from a previous level of firmware, then you would be using potentially a different key to a later version of firmware, but I'm just guessing here. So don't quote me on it. <laughs> okay, thank you, James. Hey, Jacob. Um, the ultra wide that you talked about. Yes. Is, is that uh, considered uh, more secure only because it's a, a smaller surface area? What makes it uh, more trusted than the hypervisor? Um, it's not it's not um, operating system level. Um, so it's uh, it's hardware and firmware. Um, you just make a call to it, um, and you uh, you you can't you cannot control it beyond its defined API, even as root user. Right. So from a guest TCB perspective, that would be part of the guest TCB, and uh, the guest can see what it is, and you're going to publish it openly and. Uh, the, the guest images come with that. Um, sorry, I mean the the guest image is uh, is built from. Uh, I mean, what you, what you do with the guest image is you have a very uh, a very normal Linux system basically, um, and you have a key uh, that belongs uh, to the machine, and you encrypt it, and the 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 private half of that key um, can only be read by the ultravisor. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, there are no other questions. Uh, Samuel, would you be ready? Can you hear me, Jacob? Yes, we can hear you, Samuel. Oh, great. Oh, oh great. Technology. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna discuss the benefit of uh, Safari versus Firefox on the different operating systems. That seems to work. Okay, let me just load your slides. So here we go. Oh, no, you need to be a presenter, too. No, you can switch Please slides. Say. Okay, cool. All right. So apologies for the, for the uh, audio hiccups. Um, I'm going to talk about containers, and uh, Jacob yeah. kind of touch upon it. Um, and here I'm going to talk about uh, confidential containers and uh, we call it confidential containers. It's a, uh, it, but it's a, it's a one way of doing it, I guess. There are potential other models. Um, this is the, the thing I'm going to present, and the the uh, the model and the architecture that we are working on is something that we do as part of the Cata Containers project. So this is uh, this is for now relying on the on the Cata Containers runtime, and um, because I'm. I don't assume everyone on the call uh, knows uh, the uh, architecture, the Kubernetes architecture. Uh, I'm just going to give a very, very brief uh, explanation of how things works with Kubernetes. And for, as a reminder, uh, Kubernetes is the arguably most uh, deployed container orchestration layer um, out there. And so uh, when we talk about deploying containers, deploying uh, confidential containers, um, 
we usually mean that in the Kubernetes context. So if you look at just a regular super high level um, uh, uh, Kubernetes node, uh, you have uh, uh, at the top of this diagram, uh, something called Kubelet, which is the Kubernetes agent. It's kind of the uh, the agent that receives the the commands from the from the uh, from the Kubernetes uh, control plane, and it talks to a container runtime. Uh, Containerd, for those who are familiar with it, or Cryo, uh, are the two most uh, uh, deployed one. And then it it calls into Runc typically, and Runc essentially creates a Kubernetes pod. And by Kubernetes pod, we really mean a set of processes uh, running inside a set of namespaces, C groups, and various uh, isolation layers. That's what makes a pod, uh, a set of containers that are uh, tightly coupled, logically coupled. And the, the important thing to note here is that they are uh, running off container images that are deployed on the host and that are uh, usually stored over an overlay FS uh, partition. Um, and each process can use a different container image and runs off a different container image typically. So that's the regular way of running a Kubernetes pod containers uh, in a Kubernetes environment. What we did with, with uh, Kata containers is saying, is say uh, we want to add an additional isolation layer. We want to add a, an, an isolation layer at the pod level. Uh, that's going to be based on hardware virtualization. And for that, we essentially start uh, a virtual machine, and that's going to be the pod. And inside of this virtual machine, we actually run uh, the same set of processes that are going to be running out of the same container images than the, the previous diagram, except here, those container images are going to be exported into the guest through, um, it used to be an IPFS. Fortunately, now we can, we can use uh, VertiFS. Uh, but essentially, it's a, it's a power virtualized file system that exposes the container images from the host into the guest. So that's the uh, the Kata container model. Um, we also have uh, uh, something important to note here is that uh, we have the runtime on the host, the Kata containers runtime, talking back into into the guest. Uh, there's a specific guest agent uh, running for talking to the runtime, um, and the reason for doing so is because the the Kubelet and the overall Kubernetes control plane. Uh, typically are going to want to control the, uh, the, the, the pod and the containers that are running inside a pod. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, uh, executing some processes, additional processes in, in those containers. They're going to be getting some IO. They're going to be signaling the, those processes and, and various different things. So we need to have a, a communication from the uh, Kata container runtime into the, uh, into the agent in order to forward uh, and, and basically transfer all those all those commands from the from the control plane. So that's the, the current uh, model, um, and the and the third model is the, the it's basically trying to implement is is really protect uh, container uh, container to host and and uh, protect against container to host and inter containers at, at vectors. That's like that's kind of the same uh, model that the uh, the regular runc based process based bare metal containers. Uh, are, are, are building. Uh, it's just that it, it improves uh, the third model by adding an additional uh, security layer. Um, so with, with something like Kata containers, the, the barrier for escaping uh, from the guests, uh, from, the, from the container, from the pod is higher. So what we're trying to do with computational containers is expand this container threat model and really protect containers from the host itself. Um, we want to remove the, the CSP uh, from the trust boundary. Uh, and at the same time, we want to keep the, the container uh, to host and the inter-container protection. So what we want to do uh, is basically use uh, computational computing hardware. And there's already uh, quite a few uh, products out there that are uh, proposing this, where you, 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 you can run your Kubernetes node uh, inside computational computing context. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to put an entire Kubernetes node inside a, a TD or an, an, an SCVDM. Uh, what we're trying to do is run each and every pod within its own computational computing domain. So the, 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 the boundary and the, uh, the security boundary lives at the pod level, not at the node level with this, uh, with this approach. So if, you, if we go back to the Kata Containers diagram, what we could do is basically uh, add 
some magic layer uh, run on top of a confidential computing hardware, start the, uh, the, the, the VM uh, or the TD with a, in, in TDX context, and um, let's say we are, we're done, but we are actually not done at all. So when we're running the, the part inside a, inside a confidential, confidential computing uh, context, what the only thing we do and the only thing we provide in the containers uh, and, and Kubernetes uh, ecosystem is to encrypt uh, the guest memory. So that's already an interesting use case uh, that, that further protects uh, the container to host and inter containers uh, uh, attack vectors, but it really doesn't bring the, the confidential computing model to, to uh, the container and, and Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. Why? Um, there are many points that we need to fix in order to do that. Um, as I said, the container images, which is again, uh, really what the, what the pod is gonna run. The workload of a pod is uh, the set of container images. It's not the guest image, it's not the guest kernel, it's not the guest agent. It really is contained on those, in, those, in those images. So if you leave the container images under the host control, then you're completely breaking the uh, confidential computing model. Um, there's also this uh, nice uh, VSOC um, channel that we use for uh, communicate, communicating with the guest agent. Um, if we keep it this way, uh, essentially we, we leave a complete open door for the Kubelet and the Kubernetes uh, um, uh, control plane to kind of drive what's happening inside the guest and we don't want that either. And last but not least, uh, we kind of, we, we don't really know what's booting um, uh, if we don't, if we don't test and verify. So in order to really implement uh, something that is looking like confidential containers or confidential pods, um, we need to do a few things. Um, we need to pull and keep the container images inside the guest. So it's a, it's a completely different model to, to what uh, all the current Kubernetes deployments are assuming. Uh, we want to keep all the containers image inside the guest. We actually want to pull them inside the guest, not, not inside the host. So the host won't, won't be able to see anything. Uh, we only want to use sign or encrypted container images. Uh, we want to test the guest. Uh, and by the guests, I mean anything from the firmware up to the, the, uh, the guest agent. So the Kata containers agent, which is the, the again, the piece of uh, software that uh, if you get the, if you get it here, here, the guest agent is the one responsible for actually spawning the processes that would run off the container images. So it's kind of a, a, a little a reduced runtime running inside guest. And when we want to, to measure and attest is everything up to the CATA agent. So we want to be able to, to measure and verify everything up to the CATA agent. And once we can verify that this is working then, that this is the, this is the right set of uh, software component, then we can proceed and actually start pulling uh, the container images and decrypting them, or at least verifying them. And to do that, we need to provision the guest uh, with the container images keys, uh, either for uh, 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 verifying or, or decrypting. And the last thing we wanna, we wanna be able to do is to restrict the uh, exposed uh, API. So the Kubelet API, what I'm, what I'm calling here the Kubelet API is essentially the the set of commands that Kubelet uh, and the Kubernetes control plane can forward into the guest. Um, we don't want to close everything. Uh, there are quite a few things that we can allow and keep, uh, and we think we can keep the, the confidential computing thread model intact. Uh, but we do, we do want to restrict um, uh, a few of those uh, commands and uh, requests. So if you look at what we're putting in place, um, and again, this is, uh, this is what we want to present here. This is this is some, uh, really much a work in progress. Uh, out of all those components here, uh, there's quite a few that are not ready yet. Uh, we're really actively working on this uh, with uh, with uh, people from different uh, di from uh, well, different silicon vendors, different software vendors. We're all putting this uh, together, so um, everything is open. Everything is uh, is ready for uh, for uh, feedback and and potential changes, but. Essentially, um, in the guest agent, now we're gonna we're gonna be able to pull uh, container images from any kind of registry. Uh, it doesn't have to be trusted because uh, we we're gonna pull uh, encrypted or at least signed images. So we're gonna be able to pull and unpack those container images, which means 
that all the container image management layers that are currently living on the host, that are currently embedded in uh, components like uh, Cryor or ContainerD, have now in this model to be, they have to be moved inside the guests as separate libraries. So there's a stream of efforts for uh, kind of extracting those, those pieces into uh, what we want to do are uh, Rust crates uh, for pulling, unpacking um, container images, which is the bulk of uh, container image management. Um, once we pull an image, uh, the last, the next thing we, we need to do uh, inside the guest is to uh, decrypt or verify them. And to do that, uh, we're using uh, the uh, a component that's uh, currently being worked on as well, but it's, uh, it's, it's fairly advanced already. Uh, it's called OCI Crypt, which allows for um, calling into any kind of binary through an RPC uh, mechanism. And here in that case, it's gonna be the attestation agent. And the attestation agent is going to be responsible for provisioning the guests um, with keys. And to do that, it first needs to attest the agent, get a quote from the uh, for the for the whole guest uh, uh, software stack, uh, send that to the relying party, and if uh, everything is verified as expected, get a set of uh, wrapped keys back into into the guest. Then the attestation would pass those keys back to the um, to the decryption layer. Uh, which will decrypt the all the container image layers, uh, which is something I didn't uh, get into. But uh, typically, container images are very much are, are a set of layers on, uh, uh, added on top of each other, kind of a UnionFS. Um, uh, 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 but that's what OverlayFS is is doing. Um, once we decrypt all those layers, then the guest agent will be responsible for unpacking and uh, unpacking those layers, putting them together. Uh, mounting them in the right order because it's, it gets that information from the uh, container image registry and uh, keep all those container image layers inside the guest. Um, now we have a model where uh, the host no longer sees uh, the container images, no longer is able is no longer able to tamper with the container images or even the metadata associated with the container image layers. So you wouldn't be able to uh, force the uh, the guest and the uh, and the pod into mounting different layers in different orders and, and kind of play with this uh, in order to, uh, to exploit the guest. Um, so the, the host uh, no longer sees the, the, the pod memory. It no longer sees the container images. Uh, what it still can do is send some specific commands to, uh, to the guest in order to control it. Um, and this is where we uh, are adding another, another layer of protection um, in this uh, VSOC based API between the between Kata containers and guest agent. And we're building uh, and expanding the, the guest agent so that uh, a guest owner uh, can define which part of this API it wants to support. So as a guest owner, if you are if you are saying I, I actually don't want to forward any kind of IO back into Kubernetes, I'm just going to disable this. And um, if I don't want to exec anything from uh, that, that Kubernetes is going to ask me to do, which is something that typically you wouldn't want to, to allow, uh, you can also do that. Essentially, you can take the entire um, uh, VSOC-based API and as a guest owner, uh, make business decision on which part of the API and which part of the Kubernetes API you want to support. That has um, large consequences on what set of uh, Kubernetes workloads uh, you're going to be able to support. Because uh, by restricting uh, this, this API between the, the host and the, and the guest, you kind of removing um, part of the container workloads uh, um, that, that you are still able to support. So it really is, uh, we believe, a business decision and we're providing the hooks for um, defining the set of APIs, uh, the endpoints that you want to support and adding that as a configuration file that is going to be part of the, of the measurement. So that's the model that we're proposing that we are uh, working on right now in the Kata containers uh, community. And I think uh, I'm, I'm basically getting into more details on what uh, Jacob described in the, in the previous presentation. Is Samuel? Um, yep, thank you, why? Uh, if you can go back to the previous slide. Sure. So, now, the main reason we chose to keep um, the container images uh, staged in the host 
was uh, the assumption that perhaps there would be multiple containers that would spin up from the same set of images the, the host had already downloaded. So in the model that you have here, are we kind of trading off uh, security with storage here? That's that's that is true. That is, and this and this is one of the uh, one of the limits and restrictions that I'm I'm calling out in, in the next slide, where basically the idea of being able to duplicate uh, or not duplicate container images across containers um, is kind of uh, reduced here, and the the advantages of doing so is is uh, uh, Mitigated, I would say. Um, what you can do, and and this is why we are um, adding this ephemeral block devices. Uh, uh, we want to be able to store, uh, still store the this container image on the host, uh, encrypted. So we want to encrypt these ephemeral block devices with, for example, a tenant specific key. So you would be able to uh, per tenant share your encrypted images and say. Uh, the same tenant running the same, I don't know, NGNX encrypted images with some added value on top of this. So, uh, so could be able to share those ephemeral block devices between tenants. But that would be gonna... where the deduplication would, would stop, I, I, I would say. Yeah, go ahead. So since, uh, you know, the container images are already uh, immutable, what is the additional uh, advantage we get in encrypting it? Well, they're immutable if you if you're i mean you can you can run a kubernetes pod with mutable uh container images you can run you can uh, kubernetes can ask uh, for a pod uh, with uh, writable layers on top of the uh, of the container right, right, right. so so at least you know the portions that are immutable the the, the lower layers that are supposed to be shared across containers perhaps if, if, you're, them immutable if you trust the host not to uh, poke around with them Yes. If you're not trusting the host, the host is the host can um, modify them. You could attest the the integrity of the immutable image independently in the guest, no matter where it is staged and placed. Well, it, I mean, obviously, the, the the container image could contain secrets, confidential things that you don't want the host to be to be looking at. So, and if you're if you're, it, I mean, it's it's not only about the testing. It's it's about making sure that the host does not see what your container images are containing. So you could. There's another model that we've been discussed, and and this is um, where the host would be able to um, uh, control and download encrypted images. The the thing with the encrypted the the container images uh, uh, specification for encryption is that the the images layers themselves are encrypted, but the metadata that actually is used for uh, mounting those layers on top of each other and describing the order of how you're going to mount them is something that uh, is not encrypted. So there's still a, a, a hole there where the host could decide that uh, it, it can temper with this metadata and force the guest into mounting different layers in in orders that are not expected to be to be mounted. You're still able to to test your container images. But since the, the 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 host will be able to modify this metadata, you would it, it, you you still have a, a window there where the uh, the uh, the guest could mount them in the in the wrong order. And it, it feels like you could have some intermediates. So, for example, you could have a DM integrity based. Um, base layer, OS base layer image with your whole OS on it. And you could pass that image into all of your guests. Yep. And then you could have the overlays on top of that encrypted mm -hmm. and the layering done inside the guests. Where so would the, the metadata live in that in that model. The metadata, when you mean metadata which, which part do you mean of the metadata? So the uh, a container image is a set of layers. Uh, yeah. Each layers and but it's also a set of uh, files describing how those layers are living uh, and, oh, and okay. are mounting on top of each other. So that would be, uh, well, I, I would have assumed that that would be 
uh, that, that is that layering description would be a measurement that was taken as part of the boot process as part of the attestation process i guess the, the thing with the with the attestation process is that at the t when you boot you don't you 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 don't know which container images you're going to be you're going to be pulling so the the model that kubernetes provides is it starts a pod and then it can dynamically add containers actually this is what it does it it even though uh, kubernetes knows uh, up front which containers are going to be running inside a pod there's nothing preventing it from dynamically adding containers or uh, they, and and there's nothing right now that uh, that, that Kubernetes provides in in order for a um, a, a Kata containers uh, a VM to know which containers upfront is going to have to pull. So, so uh, I got to think, if you're saying that, what what stops a malicious host adding a malicious container after my pod has started booting? Because it, because you want you. I mean, the the the, the Kata agent is never going to run a container that is not being uh, signed or encrypted, and uh, with the, with the with the key that get that get provision uh, uh, after attestation. So if as a as a Kubernetes control plane owner you you ask for a malicious container to be running there, uh, unless it's something that's signed by the guest owner, it's not going to run in the in the in the container. The parts are. In that case, I think the answer to your layering metadata question is that that layering metadata would be signed and that signature checked by the um, CATA agent. The CATA agent doesn't doesn't know. Uh, you mean signed by the CATA agent? Um. Well, I mean, checked by the cat agent. If you if you're saying that if you're saying that the cat agent is the thing that checks everything else inside the container, mm -hmm. then I guess it could be the thing that checked any layering. It does. It does check in that model the the layering and and everything else. But if you if you pull everything on the host, then the cat agent does does not see it. Right, so my, my suggestion wasn't to pull everything on the host. My suggestion was to pull each of the layers inside the guest. Yes. But to have the bottom layer be a shared um, layer. Protected um, by something like DM integrity or something like that. I mean, it, it's kind of a shame to lose the sharing aspects of containers uh, and the, the trade-off of security versus uh, shareability, uh, especially if uh, the, the common portion of the container stack is the huge portion. Um, that could be integrity protected some other way. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the suggestions here are, are pretty interesting where uh, especially given that the uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, container workload out there are sharing um, a fairly reduced set of uh, base layers, um, but it, I mean we need to think a little bit more about what it means to share the the base layers and have the hosts seeing the share the, the base layers and being able to potentially tamper with it. Um, well, not tamper. I mean, you're going to have it uh, protected, integrity protected other ways, as opposed to just encryption, and move the whole thing to a guest. It, it, is that something that you that you can do per tenant? So somebody talked about DM Verity uh, is an option here. Um, but then you would you would need to have your as provision with the uh, per tenant keys uh, and and being able to um, decrypt. And and verify base layers that are encrypted with with any tenant that comes into into your node. Is that right? I mean, uh, the my understanding is that the way something like um, DM, um, I think it's DM Integrity, I can't remember the exact name, um, works is it has some type of hash tree, so it's not actually encrypted. 
Yeah, you could, you could, you could and verifying and signing the, the the layers would be a good step, but it, you need to be able to to do that per tenant. As as a guest owner, you want to make sure that something that comes from from the host is exactly what you expect, and that's something yeah, that can be absolutely. shared across tenants. Yeah. So the integrity part is one, and the confidentiality part is the other part, right? So by encrypting, you're making it uh, not visible to anybody that uh, wants to look at it. But what's the harm in looking at you know a standard Linux uh, base uh, image on which the container is being built? That 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 image we need to make sure it's uh, coming from. The, we want to ensure the provenance of that image. Nobody has tampered with it. But uh, allowing somebody to introspect that image uh, is not going to really uh, make a problem, create a problem for what we're trying to solve here. Yeah, that's, it, 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 is, it is actually also a, a model. It's kind of an hybrid model where you would have the, uh, a set of shared base layers uh, signed, yep. at least, uh, that, that yep. could be on the host and have a, a, an even more complex model than this one where you would have some layers that are owned by the host or pulled by the host and others that are uh, uh, in, in the guest. Um, right now, what we're doing is uh, basically step zero of that, of that approach where we, uh, we put everything in the guests uh, and move the entire image management layers on the guest. If, because when you, do, when you have a sh uh, this hybrid model where essentially you, you're gonna split the entire image management layers between the guests and the host. So um, it's definitely something we, we need to look at, I think it's, uh, it's it, it, good suggestions, but um, yeah. Complexity wise, it's uh, it's probably not something we'll reach uh, with the with the first implementation for this. Sure. Okay, I think this is a good time to wrap up the discussion. Um, I think we can continue it offline if if need to be or in the chat. And um, Samir, there are some questions in the in the shared notes. Maybe when you have time, you can answer them there or in the chat. Okay. So um, we are already running a bit late. So sorry about this. No, 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 it's not your fault. So um, we are taking a break until 10 a.m. Pacific time, and then um, we continue. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Jörg. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll, exactly like uh, York said, I'll be talking about uh, deploying confidential VMs uh, via Linux on our uh, on Google's public cloud called Google Compute Engine or GCE. And I'm Mark Orr from the GCE team at Google. Let me figure out how to navigate the slides. Okay, cool. Um, so. Uh, the uh, TLDR of this talk is uh, this community's made um, great progress on getting uh, confidential VMs uh, uh, working. Uh, today on uh, Google Cloud, um, you can run just vanilla SEV, not SEVVS or SEVSNP VMs. Um, SEVVS is also supported by Linux today. Um, and I'm very inspired by all the work uh, being discussed today, and it's really awesome. Um, so on my side, uh, in addition uh, to being interested in everything being discussed today and all the technical issues, I've also um, been very involved with trying to get some of this great work running on our public cloud. Um, and I just wanted to take this time to discuss with you all uh, some of the things that we've encountered. Uh, I've, I've narrowed it down sort of to a very small number of issues and uh, depend on the level of interest. Um, we, we don't need to go through all of them if, if there's a lot of discussion, because I've sort of ordered them in terms of, of the ones that I think are most important to least important. Um, but TLDR is like merging code is not always enough to get, you know, this stuff working. Uh, there's, there's things that need to happen after that. Um, yeah, so I, the things that I've decided to talk about today, and this is deviates a little bit from my abstract, apologies on that, because I realized my abstract that I submitted had way too many issues to go over. Uh, but these slides I'm gonna talk about uh, guest image support testing, and then uh, host side um, uh, k-exec support. And again, if we don't get through all the issues, if there's lots of discussion on like, the first issue, that's totally fine. OK, so it, it should be pretty clear from the slides up to now uh, that, that the, uh, the guest image plays a huge, crucial role in, in uh, confidential computing. Um, and there's really uh, two aspects to this. 
there's fixing bugs that are uh, pre-existing in the images that you know we're offering to customers and then uh, as has come up time and time again with all these talks whether it's like migration agents running inside the uh the guests whether it's uh support for lazy accept uh so on and so forth uh there's a lot of new functionality that's really exciting that we also want to uh, uh that we need to get into images for customers to be able to use all this awesome work and so this is just um, what I did, this slide, what I did, uh, I just looked at all the images that on Google Compute Engine that are today tagged as SEV capable, which, which is a signal to customers that if, if you mark your VM as a confidential VM running on an AMD uh, platform, that you can uh, go ahead and enable the vanilla SEV. Again, no SEV ES, no SEV SMP yet. And uh, the thing to look at here is the, the cur current Linux TIFF as of last weekend is 515. And um, the images uh, running on, the, on our cloud, and I assume other clouds are similar, are just much, much, much older. Um, and so before we even get into new features, uh, we also want to talk about bug fixes. Like we want to make sure the stuff that's working today that we claim works, that we can maintain it and fix it as, as customers encounter issues. Um, and so I've, I've sort of just focused on a very narrow issue that, um, that we've run into multiple issues uh, on, on this setup uh, during the past year. Um, so looking at um, in Linux, you have a Linux guest side bug and let's say customer hits a bug. Um, we're not gonna see their bug if, if encrypted, uh, if confidential VMs are working as promised, but somehow we, we debug the guest maybe using the previous uh, debug presentation earlier, or maybe the guest uh, customer gives us a repro uh, without, that doesn't rely on any of their, their data and we can run it and we can fix it or however it happens, somehow we, get, we, we, we root cause this bug and we get it fixed. Um, there's been a, an assumption uh, as far as I can tell that we can sort of glue together pre-existing working components inside the Linux kernel and, uh, and just assume that those will work together. Um, but looking specifically uh, here at this picture, in, uh, on, our, on our cloud guest uh, uh, for the disk, they, they go through the NVMe driver. And then that uh, confidential data is bounced through the SWIOTLB component in the, in the Linux kernel. So NVMe driver works, people are using that. SWIOTLB has been around for a long time. That works. People, uh, some people use that as well. Awesome. Um, but we found a couple of interesting bugs uh, in the last year. And our experience when we went to, um, I think at least my assumption was, oh, we have these long-term stable kernels. Uh, it turns out most guest distros don't base their kernels off LTS. But I assume that most guest distros watch what goes into LTS is because they want to pick up security and bug fixes. So my assumption was like, okay, We'll send the fix to the community. They'll take it. Then we'll we'll mark it for stable, and it will go to stable kernel, and then the distros will pick it up. Awesome. Um, in reality, uh, what we found was if you know if if the bug's straightforward and simple and and all this, yeah, the the community is great about accepting the bug. But we found a pretty complicated bug uh, uh, that related to the NVMe uh, spec and uh, how it required a uh, offset into a page to uh, connote information. And that offset was being lost in the SWIO TLB and it was a very complicated fix and the community helped us a lot to get this fixed and we're very grateful. Then when we tried to send it to stable, uh, we, got, we got told and rightfully so, hey, like nobody's ever, you know, used this this way before. Why are you guys sending this to us? This is, you know, stable is all about making stuff that was working before, keeping that working uh, or fixing it. And it's not about introducing new functionality. And so, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I do have a question. If you can go back to the previous slide where you had listed all of the the images that you had in your gallery. Yep. So uh, have you gone ahead and uh, uh, hardened the Vertio interfaces in these older versions of uh, uh, releases of CentOS and RHEL and SLES? So maybe a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but we're not actually using Vertio in our um, uh, in our uh, guest IO path. Um, uh, so we have not. But you have you, you have both buffered the I/O between the host and the guest. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. So that that patch actually went in and is available in all of the upstream kernels, or is it only in the in the private kernels that you have here? 
it's available on the upstream kernels that are available on images that guest distros have made available to customers on GCE. Yeah, because only recently, I think uh, we're, we're, we're doing box buffering work in the upstream kernel. Um, and I see that you got really old kernels. Uh, so I'm surprised how you got the box buffering. So SWI, I mean, yeah, let's, uh, TLDR, SWIO, TLB is a very old. Uh, I, I get that. I get that. It's very old, but its usage in bounce buffering on the IO path, uh, that's uh, more recent. Usage. Yeah, but the although the headline kernel number there for CentOS and RHEL is prehistoric, in reality, the code we've got in there, certainly in a lot of the KVM paths, is much, much newer. Yeah. And we have tested SEV in some version number I can't remember. So, you know, it, it's not the the code involved in these paths isn't all that ancient. Yeah, I mean the TLDR is is this is all working on our images. Um, this was actually all enabled before I joined the team, so I can't go into the details on that. And even if I could, I think it's a lot outside the scope of this talk. But this is all available on our images on cloud right now. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so that's guest side bugs. Uh, so so the, again, the big takeaway here is like, how are we going to get these fixes to customers? That's that's what I want to drive discussion on. And then similarly, uh, you know, look at all the new new guest side support being discussed today. It's just a lot of it. How how are we going to get those into images? And so this is where I want to kind of back off a little bit and uh, allow for some discussion. But I'm wondering uh, what my impression is that the big players are sort of one off going to the big distros and sort of one one by one, you know, hey, can you get these patches in and and so on and so forth. I won't name any names. That's sort of my impression. And I'm wondering if this can be done, if there can be a more efficient uh, community effort here to get a set of agreed upon Linux images and distros that are interested in confidential computing to support a first class CVM based uh, confidential image that will take these patches, will take the bug fixes, have a process to go that through and so on. And so I, I'm actually gonna uh, be quiet for a minute and see if folks have uh, ideas on this. So from the SUSE side, um, first of all, the, when you have fixes for which are, which are important for confidential computing, um, we usually look at stable patches. And what we also track uh, is um, patches with fixes text. So if you add fixes text to them, they will get um, there will be email notifications in to our uh, developers, which will then um, Look into it and see if it's important and backported. Yeah, that's if you been, want to be. That's been my working assumption. I guess from uh, from empirical experience this past year, we also need a process to get patches that are not necessarily accepted by stable. I would argue. Yes. Yes. So if it if it's an important bug fix, uh, then um, we would likely take it. And with regard to a bleeding edge distro, so um, obviously Tumbleweed is usually up to speed on, on SCV and SCV support. So that's something I re regularly test. So it has all the necessary features and it can run as an ES guest. So if it's not too bleeding edge, then this can be used. Right. I'm just wondering like, what's the timeline on all this? If I go back to this, you know, this slide, Let's say we're at 515 now. So let's say some of this, this uh, let's say SMP support gets checked in at 521. I just picked a number. It maybe would be longer than that. I'm not putting any pressure on anybody. Like upstream, it, it goes the pace it goes and it goes that pace for a reason. Um, does that mean we cannot run an SMP uh, guest on a public cloud for four years? Because there's, you know, that's. No, I mean, I mean, you know, there are established processes that are used to backport features the distributions, yeah? And they're mounting this is driven by, by each vendor. Um, like they work with the distributions and they, they usually have a target and say, okay, um, and, and this, is, this is negotiated with the distribution vendor. The distribution vendor says, oh, I want to support this and, and certify it and test it by, by this release of the distribution. And 
the, 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 the hardware vendor then talks with the distribution vendor and says, okay, yeah, um, we, we sent you the, make sure the patches are in there and we work together and test it and, and whatever. Yeah. So there, there's a standard process. I mean, this because it's not limited to compliance computing, right? It's for every new hardware which needs some, some enabling. Yeah. I see that's the same way, Sandy. Um, yeah. Basically, things need to get on stream first, and then it's up to distro vendors to backport, uh, and that's a, that's a, just like an OEM to distro vendor relationship. It it totally makes sense. I guess the question here is like, is Google having to go off and talk to five vendors, and at the same time Microsoft's going off, and at the same time IBM's going off, and at the same time Intel is going off, and at the same time AMD's going off, but or can we establish I, sort of a you know confidential compute I, I, consortium? Yeah, I think that I think that there's already some some work underway with uh, within the CCC to try to coordinate the efforts between uh, the hardware vendors and the cloud providers that are going down this route of enabling this uh, and from a software ecosystem perspective. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but I mean, the, the basic thing is still that every hardware vendor works with the distribution vendors, yeah, so that was like this, and just for the cloud, because they need special cloud images, there's usually like a second step there, where, where, where also the, the distribution vendor uh, uh, Andy, can you get a little closer to your mic? Yeah. 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 The distribution vendor works works with the um, <coughs> um, and the cloud vendor because they, they they often produce like special images and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, I, I don't see this changing because this is like the standard process which has been used for everything. Yeah? So it is not just popular computing. I'm not sure it makes sense to to, to establish a new process just for confidential computing. Um, <coughs> yeah. So I, I think confidential compute has some difficulties in that it's fairly easy for us to spot things that need going into KVM because we keep an eye on that from the KVM side and we have good relationships with the CPU vendors for that as well. What is trickier is where your problem is in one of your device drivers or is in something outside KVM, we might not spot it. So I think it's good to be, if you have, if there was somebody who was gathering a list of patches that were needed for confidential computing, it would be great to have a list like that. Yeah, and it's even worse because because it's not only device drivers for functionality, but there's all this, all this hardening work here because every, every like everything, even if something is not is working, but it could be a security attack. Yeah, right. If, if the, and this makes it even worse because there can be a lot of patches. Um, like, um, that, that's something we're experiencing is that our patch kit is ballooning because and not because we need that much for functionality, but simply we, we need to harden stuff and disable things. And most of it is just disabling stuff, but but still, it's it's, it's unfortunately had to tank tackles all over the source tree. It's, uh, it's an advantage here. Yeah. Andy, ideally speaking, right, you know, I don't want to be saying that, you know, for uh, confidential computing offering on Azure, only these subset of images are allowed for customers to launch, right? I, I would like to open it up for, today there is no real restriction in terms of what image can be used in what VM SKU, but this actually is kind of bifurcating our gallery because uh, of the hardening issues that you talked about and other kernel changes that we need to make to fully take advantage of the underlying hardware. That is not, I don't know if it will be available in older versions of uh, CentOS or yeah, yeah. I agree with you, okay, but I mean, we want people to run everything they want to, right? But yeah. on the other hand, you have, to, you have to be clear and you have to be clear in your messaging that that if people run something which has not been fully hardened and fully audited and fast, they, they have a they have a security risk. And it needs to be clear to people that this is confidential computing with a keyboard and a footnote. And yeah. actually I agree with everything you said, Andy, but even before that, like not all images are going to be supported if they don't have the the you know the the patches to do VC right. handler, to do uh, GHCB protocol. So they're just they're just not gonna be supported. They're not gonna work. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the functional enabling is the most basic thing, but then there's in addition this, this security hardening enabling. Yeah? This is another layer, another yeah. complexity. Yeah? Um, but again, I mean, yeah, people can ignore the security part, but but they need to be aware of the threat. Yeah? Um, okay. uh, I don't want to cough the conversation, but I want to move on to the topic. Is there any other last uh, comments on this topic? Um, okay. 
Yeah, so let me go to the next topic and uh, and, and Jorg, if, if we don't get to the last topic on my slides, that's okay in terms of managing time. Um, okay, and I do appreciate the discussion for everybody. Okay, so now I want to talk about like testing a little bit. Um, so uh, at least in our cloud, I'm pretty sure other clouds are this way as well. Uh, we don't deploy a new functionality without tests, we just don't. And so uh, I just wanted to talk with, with everybody about um, how we can get better about uh, adding testing. And by the way, this is uh, from our side as well. You know, as I said, we run SEV today. We do have testing and, you know, on our side, my team and our, uh, my company has not done the best job always uh, sharing our uh, working in open source uh, test frameworks. So that's something we hope to do better on going forward. Um, but I also want to, uh, you know, want to see the whole community do better on this. Uh, looks like you pushing the arrow. Let me click. Okay. Um, I'd actually had this slide animated, so it may be a little too dense to uh, to go through without the animation. Uh, but what I've got here on the left side is I've got a commit. This was actually submitted by us, and we did not submit a fix. So if I'm pointing fingers at anybody, I should be pointing my say we did submit a fix. We did not submit a, a test to go along with it. So if I'm pointing fingers at anybody, I should be pointing a finger back at myself. Um, but I, I think this is something that we we from what I've seen, we can all do a bit better on. So here, what I've done on the left side, actually, I've sort of taken the um, uh, first three sentences from the commit that fixed the existing uh, bug that happened when you'd exhausted all the ACIDs for the available VMs on your host. And then you you tried to create a one more VM and uh, uh, it kind of got partway through the creation process. And then a command wasn't sent to the PSP to clean up some internal PSP state. And you can actually get the machine to state where the PSP internally has had some some resource leaked and it will not um, it, it will not allocate new VMs. Um, actually, without the animation, I think if I try to walk through this, it's just going to be too confusing. So people, the slides are on the website. You can read through this if you're interested. But basically, I just have a test that like we probably should have written to go along with this bug fix that shows, you know, step one, just reading through the comments, exhaust all the, the ACIDs that, that was to get into the condition of the bug. Step two, exhaust all this internal PSP state. And then step three, you should clean up so that you have ACIDs on the machine. And then you would expect to be able to create a VM after when you get the machine back in this good state. Uh, but because of this bug, without this bug fix that's linked here, uh, we, we couldn't do that. And so uh, this is where I want to uh, go to the next slide. So this is where I want to get into the discussion. I'm I'm personally more uh, have more background in KVM, uh, not as much in like guest uh, OVMF, not as much in guest images. A little bit from some of the debugging I've done last year, but um uh i i know there's been some recent uh exciting progress on kvm unit test first sev and on i know that there's been some work on self-test is another framework for sev so i'd, I'd like to sort of bring, highlight those those efforts and get people more interested in reviewing those patches first of all but i think even more broadly um uh, uh what other testing open source framework should we be le leveraging uh, if a customer, if a going back to the guest image discussion, if a uh, distro takes in, let's say we come up with some awesome way to tag all the confidential compute patches, and we 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 figure out a a, a way to get uh, some distros that are accepting all those, how can we 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 get the uh, some acceptance testing that uh, distros can run after they've patched in those patches to make sure they haven't actually broken things? Um, uh, so again, I'm going to be quiet for a minute to to facilitate discussion. So the one which scares us a little as a distro is where you as a cloud roll out a change to your hypervisor and then we find out the next day that none of our VMs boot. So we, I think we've got some integration with you guys somewhere for testing that, but especially with Sev, where life is hard to debug in those cases being able to find out early before customers uh, would be useful for that okay yeah i know how that's that's supposed to work but you know our company's so big i don't know that it was uh that things always work as they're supposed to work so that it seems like yeah. maybe something we can follow up offline that what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to run all the images uh, plus what we're trying to roll out on the host side to into a staging environment where no customers run and have tests running that exercise th this functionality. Um, but if we're having gaps there, we should definitely follow up and get that fixed. So should, should we be looking at, uh, you know, having our friends in kernel CI um, 
take this on. Maybe I'm testing as a, you know, a, a project, if you will. Yeah, I think what one of the things Mark's calling out here, though, is that we don't have any upstream tests that CI can run. And how do we prioritize getting upstream tests implemented and merged upstream so people can consume those? And how do we balance that with new functionality, uh, SNP, TDX coming along, where we have limited review cycles uh, from maintainers to get all of that in? I think it's it's already a good start to just run um, your all your in guest test cases you run on non-confidential VMs and start running them in confidential VMs just to make sure that your guest kernel and your guest environment is, is stable and everything. You might want to uh, spare out the performance the performance test, or at least you should get another performance baseline for confidential guests. Um, but I think that's already a good start. And then move on with the KVM unit tests for SCV and SCV ES. Um, yeah. And the rest, I think, has to be implemented. Any idea? Right. I don't no. disagree with any no. of those. How do we actually get that done, though? You know, we have n number of weeks that people can spend reviewing SEV and TDX code. How do we balance the review cycles against TDX and SMP support versus all this test support and development cycles too? I feel, Sean, part of the issue has just been that the, uh, like the patch that we posted for KVM unit tests, for example, um, without it, it's really non-trivial to, to run a, a KVM unit test under SEVS. And I think we're, I don't think self-test was as difficult, but I think we're in the same situation. So I am hopeful that once we do get this support checked into these <coughs> test frameworks, that there will be more, um, more momentum and interest from you know, other people outside the core hardware vendor uh, developers for these features to actually contribute to testing and reviewing tests and so on. But maybe I'm not being realistic. I don't know what experience will tell us here in the, uh, in the coming months. Yeah, I mean, one way to sort of I guess change up the priorities on things is, uh, you know, a lot of things that are driving priorities is sort of on the business side where sometimes the testing aspect kind of goes, uh, you know, by the wayside or it gets deprioritized. And this would sort of have to be a decision, I guess, at the maintainer level. But if, you know, if the KVM maintainer said, you know, we need this and this sort of tests in place before we accept these patches. Well, another thing, I'm, Michael, I totally see where you're coming from, and I've, I've even had those conversations with other, uh, like with Sean before I presented these slides. One of the things I'm worried about is there's already, if you look at the pat, like the SMP patch that I've been slowly going through, it's a, and TDX I haven't read, but it's their enormous patch sets. It's already a huge burden on the, you know, on on your side, on the AMD Intel side uh, vendors, uh, and I'm worried about further serializing this whole process through these Linux developers, and I'm wondering if we could. If we get the support in the test frameworks, if others in the community could could develop these tests in parallel rather than serializing everything um, through you guys, essentially. But I, again, I don't know if that if I'm if if I'm not being realistic with that idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It'd be, it'd be great. If, yeah, we could get more. Yeah, parallelize that a bit. It's just sometimes that initial infrastructure that you need to sort of get those people in a place where they feel like they can make contributions sort of rests on that initial core development effort and kind of, you know, just doing that all kind of off on its own. Um, yeah, I mean, you just have to find the right people that are willing to take that on and are engaged enough in that early development that they can do that. So, you know, you just have to find the right people, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting discussion. I think we, um, have to wrap up now, but I'd like to continue that maybe in the chat or we can meet afterwards in the hack room and continue the discussion. That sounds great, York. I appreciate it. And great. folks, feel um, free to read my slides for the last section. It was about kegs at co-site support. Folks are interested in that. Uh, and thanks for everyone's attention. So the next talk is from uh, Jim and James. I think Jim will be presenting. 
That's right. I don't do any work. Yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. OK. All right. Ready to go. Let me just uh, confirm how this works. There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is hey. Jim Cadden. I am from IBM Research. Yes? Oh, hi, Jim. Say hi, Jim. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, um, I'm from the uh, Confidential Computing Team here at IBM Research, and today I'm going to be talking about the attestation and secret injection uh, pathways of some of the work we've been uh, we've been doing over the last couple of years from my team. Uh, particularly, we're looking at the AMD SEV technology and how to bring it uh, bring the feature to the IBM Cloud as well as into the Red Hat hybrid cloud platforms. And, uh, but particularly, this is about the attestation story for confidential VMs, containers, and, uh, and pods. So the AMD SEV confidential computing hardware provides, as well as the uh, encryption of the virtual machine, provides methods for doing a attestation measurement, uh, which allows the guest owner to validate the contents of the secure VM uh, prior to any uh, confidential data being exposed, exposed to the host, which is untrusted in this uh, model, uh, as well as a secure method for secret injection. And this allows, again, an external guest owner to inject a table of secrets into the virtual machine without the host or hypervisor being able to read or see the secrets. Uh, and particularly with regular SEV and SEV ES, this these methods come in the form of a pre-launch attestation or a pre-launch secret injection, where the measurement validation and secret injection takes place prior to the actual launch of any guest instructions. Uh, secure hardware measures the initial memory footprint, which is our flash zero, and exports it via a secure channel to an external guest. The secure channel is set up uh, initially in the arguments passed to the hypervisor. Uh, the external guest then validates this measurement against an expected value and can then return a, an accept with a table of secrets in reply. And again, this is coming back over the secure channel and entering into guest memory. Uh, this, the table in the standard approach uh, comes into the EFI protected memory where it then later can be read by the bootloader or the operating system. And uh, important to note, the guest uh, secrets are uh, in a form determined by the guest owner themselves. These can be symmetric decryption keys. These can be API credential uh, information, asymmetric keys to access uh, you know, the SSH endpoints, something along those lines. Um, but a, a subtle and important point with this procedure is that the confidential components of the guest software must be gated by a secret. Uh, you, you cannot simply rely on a successful attestation stamp of approval uh, in this model uh, because there are attacks that would allow a malicious host or hypervisor to either uh, falsify an attestation report or simply just ignore the request or the result of a guest owner and simply continue the virtual machine or continue the container, uh, continue its boot. So the, the secret is effectively the, the key to start the confidential runtime. So in a, in a regular model of just a virtual machine, the way this is done is with an encrypted disk. So the guest owner encrypts the full virtual disk of their guest. This is just a LUX2 encryption with QCAL. Now, QMU, uh, more recent versions, support disk encryption uh, through this method already, but by allowing the hypervisor to do the decryption and managing the key, we're breaking the trust model that SCD is, is providing. So we need a solution where the decryption and the key handling is happening inside the guest enclave. Uh, so in this case, the 
decryption key is passed in through the attestation uh, measurement procedure. Um, it's get, uh, passed into firmware memory. We've moved the bootloader into the firmware, into the OVMF, so that it's part of the attestation measurement. And then that firmware is the one that receives the, cre uh, the key, decrypts the root partition, and starts the guest. Uh, so these are patches that originated from our, uh, our team at IBM Research in collaboration with the AMD SEV guys. And uh, most of this functionality has been upstreamed into OVMF and QMU, as well as I think there's an ongoing patch uh, in the Linux kernel for this. Now, the story shifts uh, when we're starting to talk about doing the same or providing the same type of, um, of protection as well as uh, integrity verification with a container or a pod. And this is mainly because a container or a pod in the model of CATA containers is not providing a fully encrypted disk image, but instead the kernel and then the initRD and the command line for booting the virtual machine are all part of the, or controlled by the host, part of the uh, CATA runtime uh, itself. And uh, these files are not something that are selected or managed by the external client. So therefore we need to find a way to bring these into the trust domain of the customer where the container is going to be deployed prior to the container actually being deployed or, or downloaded for that matter. Uh, so the solution we've come up with, and this is this is in this is work done in collaboration with the confidential containers project that Samuel uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, the solution that we came up with for AMD SEV was uh, these three points here. Uh, the first was the hypervisor um, computes the hashes of the kernel, the NRD, and the command line at the launch time of the guest and writes them into the initial memory of the of the guest. These hashes are then contained within the attestation measurement, which is sent to the external guest owner to be validated. So this, again, prevents the host from manipulating the kernel or changing the NRD or passing anything unexpected in through the command line. Uh, if any of those things happen, the guest owner is not going to validate or not going to pass the um, the attestation. And third step is that the firmware itself validates that the files passed in by the hypervisor are indeed the ones that match the hashes that the hypervisor computed. Because again, we are we are not trusting the hypervisor. The hypervisor could be lying about uh, what files are passing in, passing in an unmatching hash. And this final step is that the OVMF, which is again part of the uh, attested measurement. Um, the OVMF is uh, is the one doing the final safety check here before the actual um, runtime is or the actual guest is launched. And in this case, the guest is the CATA container uh, agent, which in the previous talk we spoke about, the one is going to download the container image and uh, and do the unpacking. So, as I said before, the the secret is the gate, the gateway towards actually uh, being uh, after the safety of the confidential uh, information. So, in this case, the secret tape being injected um, as part of the attestation um, procedure. The secret table is then in our solution, moved from EFI memory into a kernel reserved portion of memory. A kernel module included with the guest is responsible for now loading the uh, the contents of that secret table into a location where user space process can access it. In this case, we're using the security FS uh, file system and modeling this with entries from the GUIDs in the secret table. Uh, then at this point, the CATA agent that is part of the init procedure of the guest uh, is responsible for um, downloading the uh, container image and starting the, uh, the unpacking or the decryption process. Um, this CATA agent is talking to an attestation agent, uh, which has been 
um, an attestation agent which has a uh, an implementation specifically for this SCV pre-attestation. So in this case, the attestation agent itself is just reading from this security FS file system in local memory. Um, I'll talk about on the next slide how this attestation agent can be uh, expanded to different uh, attestation models. So uh, in this case, the like I said previously, the secrets can take many forms. We've imagined uh, these secrets can be sets of keys for uh, decrypting the layers of the container. Uh, we could also be using these as a, a secret for setting up a connection with a secure uh, image repository, for example. Um, it could be a allow list for containers to, uh, to confirm that the container that is being deployed inside this guest is, in fact, one that is expected or one that is, uh, is approved by the external guest owner. And finally, the piece of software which, is, uh, which we're currently working on in this pipeline uh, that is actively under development is this, uh, this guest attestation agent. And the goal of this project in particular is to create a hardware or an infrastructure agnostic attestation component for the uh, encrypt or for the confidential container project uh, for the CATA agent. Uh, so this would be responsible for um, handling the decryption key management for when a container when for when an encrypted container is being unpacked inside the guest. So in this uh, we have a um, library called OCI Crypt RS, which is written in Rust, which is responsible for decrypting each of the uh, container layers of the image that has been the encrypted image that's been downloaded. And this is the this this uh, library is reaching out to a local attestation agent, which is running in part of the host, which is now the sort of the hardware dependent or the the situational dependent piece that. Uh, is either reading in local memory like secure, security FS, or this is now the piece that in other attestation models like TDX or SN, uh, CV SNP is communicating to the external uh, service and doing the, the attestation handwork and uh, handshake and the, the key exchange at that point. And uh, yeah, like I said, this is this is active development or it's under the containers project at the URL uh, below. And that is, uh, that's the end of the slides I have prepared, but I have a little complicated diagram here that shows this full pipeline and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Let me read the chat. Well, I think everybody agrees to the way we do attestation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. I'm trying to parse this chat, but it looks like it's a carry on from the previous conversation. So I'm, I'm happy that we are. That was a that was a good talk. I'm happy that it's so engaged. So, so one thing I don't understand about the the Qatar container ecosystem is, um, well, I've seen different different approaches to make confidential computing working for Qatar containers. Um, Will those exist? Will those coexist in the end, or will there be discussion to join the efforts? Or um... so the, all of the conversations, at least today in this microconf uh, conference, uh, are we're all in collaboration on this under a same confidential container uh, initiative. So the the actual implementation design would be that your deployment of Kubernetes or OpenShift or just plain container D with CATA containers, uh, you'd simply just enable confidential guest containers. And then the, the system would recognize which hardware we're on, whether it's SEV or TDX or Z, 
and the the correct level or the correct approach of providing the confidentiality would would be implemented. Hey Jim. Yes. The workflow you have here in this slide, uh, while it being described in the context of uh, you know confidential containers, there's nothing here that says it couldn't be used for a CVM workflow as well. Where I'm not interested in containers, but it's just an IaaS VM that needs to spin up uh, in a confidential fashion and secrets being injected into that. Uh, why is that not the focus as well of your effort? That is the focus of the sort of the first generation of this work is creating the sort of the, the infra, uh, infrastructure as a service model with SEV and, uh, and then how to do attestation and secret injection with that model because it, it uh, provides the same type of guarantees. This is uh, the slide earlier when I talked about it uh, with the Lux encrypted uh, boot disk. Um, and you're right, the, the procedure from a, from a cloud provider perspective is, is largely the same. And the, uh, the sort of the, the KVM in the sense in this graphic is the, it, you know, is the CATA uh, guest in, in the sense. So, um, so a layer sort of on top of this would either be the, the IIAS platform or the, the container platform, like a, a Kubernetes with CATA containers. Uh, but the actual um, exchange of files and information and secrets is is the same. Right. So from a distro vendor perspective, uh, this workflow here in terms of how you provision uh, a CVM image and customize it to a customer uh, key, tenant keys, for instance, and then uh, how you go about launching it uh, to the extent that the, the workflow of the launch impacts some of the uh, pre-boot or boot components of the distro, It'll be nice if we can, uh, you know, collectively standardize on how this should work because each of us is is inventing the same wheel, uh, and I'm not even sure if the way we are doing this workflow. You know, I haven't looked at other cloud providers, but we do obviously have something equivalent of this today, and uh, we are going to ask our distro partners to, you know, plug into our workflow. And I don't know if we, each of us will go and talk to Susa and Red Hat and Ubuntu to do something slightly different because we have chosen to do these things a little differently. It's actually worse than that because potentially we have that for each of Sev and TDX. So potentially we have each cloud vendor and each technology multiplied by distros and possibly then multiplied by whether it's a plain VM or a container. So if we're not careful, the number of attestation mechanisms and startup mechanisms grows crazily. It already has. Well, so, but we can answer that a bit. I mean, if you look at this attestation mechanism, it works both for containers and for VMs. The only slight difference is you have to pass the secret up further for a container because it has to go into the guest kernel. Whereas for a VM, you pass it up to the bootloader and it then decrypts the disk. So I think we can at least unify that workflow for both uh, CATA containers and for confidential boot. The next problem comes how you unify the technologies. And part of the issue here is that some of the technologies mandate secrets be done in specific ways. Um, and there are possibilities that the latest generations of technology then become incompatible with this. And for those, trying to find a uniform overarching architecture is very difficult. We suspect we have one that will work for SMP as well, this diagram, but we haven't actually proved it yet. Yeah, and everything that exi that exists in user space, where you're doing in in the open source. But I know at this point, you know we have our we have an attestation agent. Intel has an attestation agent. Alibaba has an attestation agent. So there has to be some sort of consolidation as as time progresses. But I suspect that will that will happen with time. The biggest nasty is actually the attestation flows. They're all radically different among all of the CPU vendors because nobody ever thought of agreeing on them. So 
we have to have a, at least some agent probably in user space that knows how to do all of the attestations. And then we have to have agreement on how this secrets flow once injected. Because if you look at the injection mechanism that's being proposed, Intel, AMD, and in fact everybody else proposing different secret injection mechanisms, we're trying to rally everybody around the open source components we have, which is uh, the firmware OBMF, the bootloader, either Grub or direct boot to kernel in this RD, in which case we need the kernel in this RD to accept the secret, but it's a bit like herding cats. So James, should there be a forum where we talk about, you know, uh, how we can herd these cats? Uh, well, um, Jim will tell you about the cat containers forum where this discussion is going on. Unfortunately, they seem to meet at very unfriendly times for the Pacific Coast. So I haven't actually been to any of their meetings. I was more interested in the on the CVM side. Um, on the which side? On the confidential VM side. The, okay, so all of those conversations have been on the upstream mailing list, but because we don't have a single list, they've been fragmented on this partly up on the TMU list. Um, there hasn't actually been anything on the KVN list of confidential boot because we don't need to modify the kernel, and the rest has been on EDK2. This is sort of the problem we actually face with the whole of confidential computing, the nastiness of it. It's not really a separate area on its own. It's actually a stack threading problem. And that means you have to deal with all of the individual components of the stack on their own terms, which is why all these conversations get fragmented across all the stack component mailing list. In some ways, this is sort of something that open source technology doesn't do that well. Hopefully now we have the Linux confidential computing list, we can CC that list on all of these. So at least there's one single source to go to. But we then have this huge problem that if you look at the two lists I had to deal with, the EDK2 list is actually a closed list. So if I CC Linux Cocker mode, then we have a problem that anybody who replies gets bounced by that list and then that list gets annoyed and so on. You know the problem. Yeah. I think so when we first started this, the Kokomo list didn't exist. I think this micro conference is just some more evidence that confidential computing and this community is coming into form. So I think these this is where these types of conversations can and will happen. As, uh, as the months and years go on. A quick question for us. We, we have the Confidential Computing Consortium as well, right? Wouldn't that be a place where to kind of put some of these questions, like a tag there? Well, it's a bit of corporate. We need something a bit more open source. I mean, it would be a place to house stuff, but the problem is not handing everything over to a, a different forum and then having them fix it for us. The problem is how we bring all of the current stack components into alignment and get them to agree on this particular threading model for the stuff we need to do. And that's not really something that a confidential computing forum can help us with because it's not the exclusive province of confidential computing, right? Because mm -hmm. each of the stack components has their own separate consideration is different from confidential computing. I think Dave has something to say. Dave, can you unmute and make your statement? He may not have a uh, microphone access. Okay. Uh, Dave no, says that the, uh, the uh, confidential consortium meetings are public and open. Okay. CCC. Yeah. 
Right, but all that provides is another open forum. We still need to get people to the forum, and the more painful thing is we need to get people from the stack components to that forum. I can't see people from Grub wanting to go to a CCC meeting, or even people from QMU, although perhaps they would want to go. James, you know, uh, I'm sure every one of the cloud vendors has a, a provisioning workflow and launch workflow for confidential VMs today because we are about to go live with these things, if not already live with those features on our platforms. It would be kind of interesting to kind of uh, show and tell what our workflows look like and how does it compare with you know, Red Hats or uh, AWS and Google and see if there is some way we can come together in terms of not having to make separate requests to each of our distro partners in terms of how they should support our platform. Yeah, I think so. Oh, sometimes. I think sometimes I actually sometimes. did the work like that on KVM Forum last week. So if you look at my KVM Forum presentation, hopefully it will be on the video very shortly, it details the workflow of the IBM proposal for confidential VM boot of encrypted yeah. images. No, it's not like, you know, we're starting from green fields here, right? We've been working on this for a while, so we all have invested something here. So we should look at what parts, what's the best of what we have and see if we can work there. I think the main problem is, I mean, it, it's open source. So right at the moment, it's very new. We're chucking stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So having lots of different projects doing lots of different things isn't necessarily bad. We just have to come together after we finally agreed what, what it is we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right, and that's where we need sort of forums to help us with this. I think Matt Wilson was trying to say something as well. I saw him pop up. Yeah, I was just trying to say that uh, uh, sometimes um, it, it makes sense to, to kind of sit back a little and see what is actually working in practice. Um, and I think that that's worked really successfully in, in how the cloud uh, started in, in taking kind of a, um, a building block that everyone understands, like a virtual machine running in a, in a cloud that has an API that you, you started. Like it, 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 it was really just an extension of something that was already uh, used successfully in practice, kind of in the industry, you know, to get useful work done. And, and we're still in early days here. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, the different proposals and what works and what, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's a good time to uh, wrap up the discussion. Um, Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, too, uh, Jim and uh, James, for presenting. So I think we are running pretty late, but let's go over to our last session for today about securing trusted boot. Um, Stefan, you're going to present. Yes, thank you. Can I... oh, sorry. Yeah, wait a minute just to find you in the list here. You should okay. be now a presenter. Okay, how do I? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, um, hello everyone, um, and also thanks Jörg for setting this up, um, and everyone's still staying for the last session. Uh, my name is Stefan, and I'm, I'm joined by Andras, um, and we're both working for a company called Decentric. And um, I think we are, we're kind of wearing a different hat than most of the other people so far, because we are actually actively running Intel SGX in production for several years now. And basically, in this talk, um, um, now with having access to especially as CVSMP, right, um, we gave it a go and, and tried to kind of import one of our applications from SGX to kind of the new world, right, which is based on confidential virtual um, machines. And uh, so we're not experts in this field, and that's why we kind of really want to get feedback on, on the current approaches that we have taken. Um, let's jump into why we're actually um, using confidential computing at a really high level and basically it is all about uh, yeah, enabling confidentiality and integrity of multi-party computations uh, remotely on the cloud. Um, so having kind of a, a really kind of high level walkthrough, right, um, what's typically done is some, let's say a data analyst um, can define some, some level of, of uh, uh, compute logic that uh, she or he is interested in. Um, that finds the data sets um, that kind of uh, uh, this compute logic or this query is run against. Um, and then to a CC enabled platform. And then we have one or multiple data owners that potentially could ingest data kind of to kind of build the foundation or build the need for this kind of computation. 
And uh, um, what we now do here is basically that before any data owner ingests any data set, um, there's a full kind of um, CC proof um, of the environment. And that really means like we do a full, um, the client is able to uh, um, completely verify um, the trust execution environment that this is running in, and also kind of completely verify um, what is the compute logic that is being applied here, right? So this is not only uh, um, um, kind of what has been ingested here, but really the complete TCB and in that case is running in SGX and it's being kind of measured here, right? And the client attests to whenever there's an interaction. And we also use um, an illustration to then uh, establish a secure uh, channel such that the data owner can ingest uh, the data set and then the, the computation can be executed and the results again uh, uh, passed to the kind of original data analyst. And um, you see, we need a couple of unique guarantees here. I think there are most of them we already touched or talked about today a couple of times. Um, but in our context, uh, code, audit code auditability is, is really important um, um, because, yeah, as highlighted, um, the data owners um, that case should be completely able to kind of audit the code, understand what is kind of the, 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 the logic, compute logic that's run against their data. And due to this kind of, yeah, auditability is important, but with that also attestation, right? Uh, uh, they need to verify that exactly that code they have audited is really running also remotely. So we have a, a large focus on kind of measuring uh, 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 um, the workload, right, and adding that to the station flow. And last but not least, um, code flow integrity is really important because um, um, with the kind of SGX technology so far, which are application process based, most of this is custom, and we can quite well um, um, kind of uh, understand, um, yeah, how the code, what kind of what is the the, the code flow happening here. But obviously, and we will talk about this right now with VM-based, um, and the code surface is much larger. We put in um, a software that has not been developed for this purpose, right? And, and kind of we need to take care of this, right? And uh, these are also the, the two um, yeah, um, um, topics you want to uh, dive deep in uh, a little bit, starting with the attestation. And, and basically what we need um, in our case is, uh, is measured boot, right? So there's no secret needs to be injected. We don't want to hide any of this. It's kind of plain vanilla, trusted or measured boot. Um, and so based the, the projects or the proof of concept we have done um, using the hardware so far is, uh, are quite simple ones here. Uh, um, and basically the first one is uh, just, yeah, um, um, fusing everything together, right? The firmware, the neuron of S, the kernel, the command line, um, and then kind of measuring this at VM launch, and then the user can uh, attest to this uh, um, um, before connecting. Um, this comes with a couple of problems. I think um, first one is that that's kind of, yeah, it kind of it gets a bit hairy with like, um, um, yeah, baking in the entire um, image into the original firmware with, with some uh, hypervisors, um, but also um, we need to path this entire block through the secure processor, so it can take some time. And so basically one, one easy way to fix this is like adding one level of indirection, right? A hash chain basically where, where in the firmware we can now bake in, they expect a value and during booting during the firmware, we're actually uh, are just asserting that um, whatever is being loaded here is like the expected value and only this checks out kind of uh, control um, um, continues, right? And that's passed onto the kernel. And um, that's not ideal either because um, um, that means whenever anything changes in the kind of kernel run of us, we need to update the firmware, which is not nice. So ideally, we would do this a bit more dynamically. Uh, um, I think um, um, one way to do this is yeah, add some notion of isolation name, name spacing here, um, which would be uh, like uh, this allows it to kind of a, a chain of this attestation flow, which um, VMPL could be used for. I think generally really nice would also be some kind of PCR-like scoping, right? Uh, that allows you to get this monotonicity. And I just heard actually of, of, of Jim, I guess, from, uh, from IBM, that is also a way to, to pass it through uh, from the hypervisor and then add a raised the station report later, basically the expected value. And with this push this to the, um, um, to the kind of, to the client to do the assertion here. So basically with this measure boot, we're, we're kind of, I guess I'm feeling comfortable with like the options, um, but now the big question is really um, what is the firmware and what is the kernel that we're booting here, right? Uh, and with that, I will actually give it a uh, handover to Anbush. So um, 
the the firmware the obvious pick for the firmware is uh is ovmf uh we have tried uh, a custom firmware as well but uh we are realizing that really the, the community effort is behind um ovmf and uh intel and amd are both uh submitting patches to ovmf and there's uh there's very uh special code that needs to be run uh to actually enable uh computational computing um so and, and we don't want to basically maintain our own uh, stack for this so um we actually did a poc using ovmf and actually the, the previous talk uh i think we used most of that work um we extended it a little bit so uh we added um uh, in grub we added uh, a way to assert the um the measurement of um of the loaded uh, efi image and we used like uh, a, a unified kernel image as the FI image. So that contains um, the internal FS, the kernel, and the command line. Uh, and then basically the grub in the grub configuration, you can assert uh, the, um, the the hash of what you're loading. Um, and one of the things that we realized during this POC is that uh, it's actually very easy to trigger a rescue shell um in in grub uh if you're a, a malicious hypervisor and then realize that actually there are all these different ways that the hypervisor can influence the the control flow of the vm um and sort of our big problem statement and questions around this and i think a couple of talks actually uh mentioned this like how do we actually go about securing all these different ways the hypervisor can influence the vm's control flow um, uh, when using existing software like ovmf or the linux kernel which were not written with uh, malicious hypervisor in mind um, so uh, there are a couple uh, in, in the in the picture you can just see a, a very crude representation of a control flow graph and the different ways that uh, information can be injected into the vm like at the very beginning of the VM launch, we already have parameters passed into the VM from the hypervisor, which is coming from an untrusted land. Uh, things like the, the memory map or uh, ACPI tables. Uh, how do we actually secure all this? Uh, we need to guard against uh, uh, malicious uh, virtualized devices. Um, uh, I, a couple of days ago, I heard about uh, option ROMs, which I, I didn't know what those were. Uh, but basically, you you plug you plug in uh, arbitrary code. Basically, you can inject arbitrary code into the VM uh, through that. So it's uh, we have all these features that were developed for um, for OVMF and, and the kernel, but uh, all those features suddenly become attack vectors uh, in in the computational computing uh, realm. <coughs> So, yeah, so, um, so for, for, for the Linux kernel, like I talked about earlier, we're dis we disabling all of this. So we have a lot of patches, which, and for PCI, we basically removing all the features apart from the most basic here. <clears throat> like there's mm -hmm. so many, you're right, there's so many features and all kinds of weird stuff. <clears throat> yeah, but, but PCI is only the tip of the iceberg. There's also a lot of other things there. Yeah. It's a pretty big attack surface. So, so the key is really to minimize, both minimize, <clears throat> and, all, and then the rest has to be audited and fast. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, sorry. So, uh, so w w one thing that uh, I noticed is that I think there are actually different kinds of use cases that people have for computational compute. And one of them is to take existing operating system, existing distributions, and try to make it secure, sort of. And we come from different background where we we really don't need any of the those features, right? We just don't need those drivers. We don't need anything. What we really need is the bare bones uh, byte stream in and out of the VM, right? Uh, and like VSOC, for example, is a is a good abstraction for no, this. No, but sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. even even the even the standard distributions don't need the drivers, yeah, because they need they need always for features which are not available in a in a guest. So I, I don't think your problem is that different from a generic distribution problem. <clears throat> yeah. So, is there is a coordinated effort that uh, that is trying to cover these uh, these attack factors? Um, I mean, I would say it's an ongoing process. I mean, we we are doing a lot of work on the kernel, um, <clears throat> and um, there's work on the um, on the on the um, firmware 
I think um, I think they, you, you should probably go to Elena's talk at the security summit. She's talking about this more. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I mean, I, I think yeah. So Sorry, I think currently Grab, Grab is kind of missing. So so nobody is uh, working on Grab, and Grab is a big mess because there's <laughs> not a single Grab, but a bazillion different forks. But <clears throat> other than that, I think that is ongoing work. Yeah. Hey, I've been working on Grab. I mean, I also want one like a feeling like like obviously, um, and I think that also has been talked before that it's a lot of work to enable all the different like hardware kind of vendors, right? So uh, um, with the different technologies that we're also having, and uh, it kind of makes sense that kind of I guess from the from the hardware vendor they pick OVMF because it's kind of the the most mature project and allows everything, right? Kind of will boot windows and stuff like this, right? But but I have the feeling now we have this gap, right? That other projects, and I've seen also the talk from Sergio and Lipke run and so on, um, really wanted to have something like a really minimal firmware, like a really stripped down firmware, right? Um, where none of the stuff exists. We don't need a we don't need shell in there. We don't need all this like uh EDK2, like all of this but not all of this should be pulled in, right? Um and um, and however we step and leaves us with the fact that Kind of, we need kind of all of this work needs to be done again, right? We need to like on a, on a separate firmware. Like, so we have two options, I guess: either take yeah. OMF and find a way to really strip that down, or kind of agree on a on a like with Qboot or Rust firmware, or whatever, where kind of all of these kind of kind of hardware no, primitives are being implemented. I mean, the, the way I see it is, um, I, often people look at just the code size, but the code size is not the right metric. The right metric is how many communication points you have. Like, like for mm -hmm. example, it's the same the analogy with a network server. You don't mm -hmm. care how big your network server is, but you care about is um, how, how, how much communication does it have with the outside. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and and so and that, that I think the trick is that that's what the approach we had is that oh we, um, we we take an existing code base and we we disable things which we don't need in the existing code base. Um, <clears throat> and but but for the other things. Um, I mean, for a lot of other stuff, you 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 can basically say, oh, you you can't just have like kind of like a firewall. That's the approach we had, right? So let's say, oh, if they, if we have a, have a megabytes of codes in the in the firmware, yeah, as, um, it, it's only attackable when it does MMIO or PCI config space read or um, <clears throat> things like this. Yeah, so communication points. So if you can secure the communication points and and have a law list there and so on, um, <clears throat> then then you you can. It, it doesn't really matter how how big the code base is, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. because, because that's the only thing that really matters. Yeah. So, so making it concrete, just as again, we're kind of newcomers to that space. Like we don't actually need Grub, um, right? Because um, we don't, we don't, we we don't, don't have any, <laughs> we don't have encrypted uh, uh, and this if we want to like load here, right? Uh, and so actually, that was just for convenience. So, um, is there anyone kind of familiar with an effort that? You can kind of join or contribute to that kind of takes OMF and tries to like really strip away all the things that that take that are not needed to run a minimum Linux kernel. So so the so the OVMF and so Grub is not really needed even to boot a Linux kernel. Sure. Right? So we, Linux already has um, support for directly booting from exactly the exactly. Yeah. So, so this can be just used. But however, the problem we had is that there were various distributions that started out. They still need on Grub for some functionality yeah, or for commonality. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I mean, if you if you if you don't care about um, having a standard distribution, then uh, there's no need for Grub at all. Just just boot yeah. directly. Build the kernel with the EFI stub, and you're good. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> but but I mean, you, you still you still have to um, to to secure the um, the firmware uh, actually, right? and the kernel. There's a yeah. problem there. Yeah. Yeah. In what you propose, if you use Grub, you can have the encrypted envelope being the entire VM image. If you want to boot directly to the kernel, the kernel has to be accessible to EDK2, to OVMF. OVMF can't read our encrypted file systems. So something has to bridge the gap or, bridge the gap or supply the kernel from outside the encrypted virtual machine. And this is sort of contrary to the way we currently use VM images. It's not a it's just one of these annoying threading problems that keep occurring in confidential computing. Yeah, I mean, so this is actually one thing that uh, we wanted to comment on, that our use case actually doesn't require encryption of the disk at all, right? Uh, encryption of, of memory is sufficient. It's, we're not, we don't want to protect the, that we are using like a, a Linux kernel 
uh, with some or, uh, with this application logic, right? There's no secrets in there. Uh, all the secrets are provisioned dynamically once we attested the actual software uh, hash. So, um, so I, I, this is why I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You, you still need uh, authentication on the disk because if an attacker can randomly change your user space, then then obviously you cannot do anything securely. Yet. So even though, I mean, you, you don't need encryption, but you still at least see some, some kind of hash scheme or something. Um, yeah, so, so we yeah, don't need it 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 to measure it. Right? Idea. Yeah, measurement is needed, totally. Right? Uh, I think it's more about like, really, are we able to read from a lux to kind of encrypted kind of image or something like that, right? Which is obviously a bit more um, um, uh, like important than kind of computing a hash when you map in. Um, yeah, yeah, the, I'm, I'm, yeah in, in, our, in our standard TDX model, I mean, what we had originally proposed was, oh, you just have an unencrypted um, a partition, which, mm -hmm. which can be read by um, by by the EDK, ED, OVMF, by EK2, mm -hmm. and it contains the kernel and not encrypted, another NLD not encrypted, but they then are tested using using the attestation protocol, and when they are um, are tested, then then they they can they can can be executed, and this way you, you this way you don't need any grub because the yeah. uh, <clears throat> exactly. The EDK2 can do it directly, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but still, like maybe a question, like I'm, not, I'm still wondering if anyone kind of worked on, like, um, you know, what there are weird, these weird cases, right? And you, when you're at the right moment, moment mount a disk or something like that, right? Suddenly you end up in this iffy shell or stuff like this, and you can do whatever you want, right? And you're kind of, especially you, your VM launch attestation is out of the window, right? So I, I really still think. We should, uh, um, even like taking Grub out, even OBMF, I mean, at least seems to be, if you just tinker with, around it, with it a bit, has, has a lot of features that, that can be abused really easily. Mm -hmm. I think you should have a, you should have a look at um, LibK, right? I see Sergio wants, wants to say something. He's actually the author of it, so Sergio. Um, can something? you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. sure. Yeah, but so basically, that's uh, I think that's liquor run approach basically. So the idea of uh, what liquor run does, well, originally it simply loads the uh, the kernel image into the guest uh, memory, mm -hmm. but of course with ACB, uh, you cannot boot directly into the guest uh, because you cannot set the page table directly from the BMM. So uh, what uh, we did is build a very, very small firmware that that's just the bare, bare minimum needed to set up the environment and jump into the, uh, to the yeah. 60 byte, 64 byte entry point. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's that's basically, that's all, all the features uh, that the and, future firmware and, provides. And that's based on Qboot, right? Yep. Yeah, and so, and would that mean like, I mean, obviously that's now like, now there's SMP support, right? There will be TDX support. I guess that's what I was also was the direction I would have like driven the conversation that another option obviously would be to to just take a really minimal firmware like Qboot and try to make sure we have kind of all of these security related and relevant primitives also there as well, right? Um, and it seems like you guys have started this. Is this kind of a commitment to kind of a long-term support or <laughs> how would you see that? Well, to this point, is, this is uh, mostly an, an experimental project, so uh, it's hard to make any long-term commitments. Uh, the good news is that uh, we've tested so far up to, up to SCB SMP, mm -hmm. and we know well, that we can get away with doing very little to get into putting the gas kernel, so that's great. Uh, we're also experimenting with uh, some other stuff, such as not needing to communicate with a hypervisor for anything at all, not even for obtaining the uh, the amount of run or the number of CPUs, and by having that information also injected by the attestation server, so to keep the communication channel as minimal as possible. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. The, the, the good thing is that in the end, there is not much code to maintain because there is not much code at all. In Qboot, you mean, right? Yep. Yeah, no, that's especially in the stripped down version of Qubit. I don't remember the exact number of, of lines, but it's, it's very small. But so you have to implement things like this, like GHCB protocol and like weird interrupt handlers and like basically just the minimum. Okay. Yeah, just the minimum even to boot. For example, uh, the uh, last version uh, support for the BC uh, for the BC handle for the BC exceptions. Just to be able to uh, boot SCBES properly without hard coding the CBIT. 
Uh, but yeah, it's the idea is to just add the minimum to get the, um, uh, the, the kernel up and running. That's so the, 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 the idea is not that the firmware doesn't have, need to have any entity by itself. It's just a way to start the kernel, which is well, we, we, are, we are interested in. No, exactly. And I think we are as well, like, and let's, let, my last question, like the, for example, like the parameters we usually get from passing by a firmware config, I, I guess there, that that's not part of it anymore, um, from what I've seen, at least from the, from the code, but um, did I understand this correctly, that like memory layout, like, um, like all of these things, we listed there, the parameters usually pass in, they are, they are kind of propagated through the attestation or, or like how, how do you now deal with these, with these kind of yeah, configs that, that we need to provide somehow, right? Yeah, so uh, basically the, uh, the thing is that the, uh, for the SCB and SCBS model, the, uh, those parameters has passed, has, has injected has passed of the, uh, has part of the secret. Mm -hmm. So the, the secret yeah. is for a one page long, so you can put wherever you need that. Yeah. Another more radical approach will be to have the attestation server to provide the firmware, which is not that large by any means, it's like 64 bytes. Uh, so yeah, it's something that, that is uh, 64 kilobytes. So it's something that is doable, and that way you will provide a custom firmware for each uh, VM, which mm -hmm. is of course an extreme approach, but it's something that's doable and it's interesting and maybe worth exploring. Oh, okay. And, uh, I mean, I think it, what, what would be really nice also, is, um, and I'm I'm not sure if anyone like of the kind of AMD maybe later on or TDX thought about this, like that we have a similar model, like we have. A like TPMs, right? That we actually, we could just put all the parameters in the first PCR register, right? And like have the, that kind of, this kind of monotonicity that we can leverage here. Uh, um, um, I think right now this will be still really hard to do, um, but yeah, I think that would be kind of uh, an interesting approach as well. Okay, so I think this is a good time to wrap up the discussion. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, by the way, for everyone uh, participating in the conversation. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks for your session. Um, so I think we can move on the discussions to um, one of the hack rooms soon. But before we close um, the confidential computing microconference, Let me thank the sponsors again. Without um, them, this uh, microconference and all of the Linux plumbers would not have been possible. So first of all, Facebook is a diamond sponsor, and IBM is a platinum sponsor. And also, of course, ARM and Microsoft as the gold sponsors, and the silver sponsors, Amazon, Netflix, and Red Hat. Um, Collabora as our speaker uh, gift sponsor. Uh, thank you. And we have our T-shirt sponsor. Thank you as well. And last but not least, of course, many thanks to the Linux Foundation who is providing um, the conference services for Linux plumbers. Jörg, how, how do we get VMware T-shirts? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest, from what I heard, I might well, be wrong. I can tell you that. So yeah. the T-shirts will be mailed out. We, we, you can't give them to you, obviously, to the first 200 people who fill in the closing survey. So there'll be a survey announced at the closing. So if you don't attend the closing, you won't get the link, you won't get a t-shirt. And if you do attend, you'll get the link, and the first 200 people who fill it out will get t-shirts. Okay. I'll be sure to fill it out. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, I think we had some great discussions. And maybe we can continue them now in one of the hack rooms. I see hack room five is empty, so maybe we just gather there and continue the discussion there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>